Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, Tashun. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to have you back because, uh, you know, we, I had really enjoyed our last podcast. And, you know, increasingly, I've been thinking of these as like, the first one is typically like more of an interview and there's some conversation, but like yeah. when I've had the interview and it's like, yeah, there's the shared context, uh, we can go deeper in conversation. And um, I always enjoy our chat. So I'm just excited to get into the conversational mode with you. Yeah, thanks. And I'm looking forward to it as well. I mean, we've been talking a lot in various other channels that aren't podcast based for a while <laughs> now. So it's just, I feel like I know you a lot better as well compared to last time. So I think there'll be much more richness and just stuff to, to riff on. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I think one thing we've been talking a lot about recently that might be a good place to start is like, um, well, you of course sort of uh, transpilled me, as we say these days, in our <laughs> parlance, in our corner of the internet. Do, do we say that? <laughs> well, we say pilled, <laughs> but not We do trans. say pilled. Yeah. We do say <laughs> uh, So in this case, you and I say transpilled. But, we do now. <laughs> uh, and junipilled. You know. And junipilled is a good one. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Uh, in any case, that's what happened. And, um, you know, I've been sending you more tracks recently as I've kind Love of gone it, yeah. deeper down the rabbit hole. And uh, I know, well, one, it's been so nice to talk about what, like, we enjoyed listening. And you recently made me another playlist, which I so appreciated. And, um, but also, it seems like we both have sort of like hopes or ambitions mm. to maybe make some of that ourselves at some point. And I feel like that could be, well, I'm actually interested in talking about the listening side as well, but also the yeah. making side of like, um especially because like yeah on my end like it seems like I'm I'm developing my taste and I'm like realizing that I like the like maybe I'm liking like the the what they call like deep house more than the trance yeah. right now uh yeah but I don't actually know watching that yeah yeah it's, it's so hard to pin down the genres I mean there are so many of them right um but I've been sending you a bunch of trance because of trance then Juno Beat stuff mm -hmm. and then you've been kind of sending back more <laughs> of the the deeper darker kind of <laughs> like this is some words the kind of thing that i'd often describe as filthy ah, <laughs> um ah. there's there's an element of that in it um ah. which is like oh oh that's yeah. really <laughs> like that's interesting you know, uh -huh. I, I really like the music as well but it's like i'm just surprised and i'm liking that you're liking it as well because you're going on quite the journey here and it's, it's so fun to navigate hey i like this what else is like that and then you get spotify rec like automatically recommend <laughs> stuff and it's like who else what what else has this artist done and we're going to try that stuff and it's, it's such a choose your own adventure story um mm -hmm. i love just watching you navigate that that decision structure if you like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah there's a certain sound i've been finding i really enjoy i don't even know how to describe it but it's like these like very thick, like almost almost like Hans Zimmer like sounds oh, yeah. that's like, you know, and they like <laughs> yeah. drop the beat and it's like, you yeah. know. That's and what I would call filthy. Yeah. Filthy. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why why that word? It's such an interesting ah. word choice. Like, it's, do you mean like morally filthy or like no, dirt of the earth I, filthy or like I'd, something else? I, I think this might be a Britishism. Um, okay. But it's it's kind of a combination of those things. Even it's like I, I was discussing this with a friend. Like the word "filthy" is like it's the it's the word you use when you go like oh, ooh, uh, ooh. you know, like that kind of. Ooh, is that ooh. a good thing? <laughs> it's a good thing. It's okay. A, it is a good. It is a good thing. But it's like like a surprisingly unexpected. Um, I, I will have to. I have to think about this some more because like I, I now can't define what filthy is. And it's that it's that like heavy thick bass yeah. drop. The like yeah. the like the the wide vibrato the, the wide the long beat to it like almost feels like a mini earthquake almost it's like mm -hmm. yeah there's something i cannot at all find the words for it now that i've read yes filthy is the word mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I i will i will happily get, put some more thought to it and kind of come back <laughs> later mm -hmm. on as to what things are filthy it's like seven lions if you know seven lions and mm -hmm. there's there's some real like uh and like a dark energy to it almost mm -hmm. in a like I don't mean like morally bad or mm -hmm. in any way like evil. I just mean like shadow stuff almost. Mm -hmm. The kind of shadow energy is coming out, like strong masculinity or strong mm -hmm. esoteric stuff or strong whatever. It's like, ooh, there's something else there beyond just the superficial level of like, well, that's happy or well, mm -hmm. that's sad. It's like, hmm, that's complex. That's complex. Yeah. There's like extra stuff there that takes some time to un like to, to figure out and like be in almost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
That sounds yeah. incredibly pretentious, like I'm describing some kind of fine wine or something. No, I, <laughs> that's I'm kind of how well, it is. <laughs> maybe it sounds that way, but over here, I'm just like, yes, someone knows what I'm talking about. Mm. And I mean, and it's not a particularly subtle sound, but um, no. but it's like, <laughs> it is very specific and like complex. And I, I love hearing you talk about it. And mm. like, yes, that is the thing that I like. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I mean, it's really good to dance to. It's just like, oh, when the, when the, when the beats drop like that, it's mm. like, oh, this is fun to dance to. And um sounds really good and something else that I notice I really like about the more deep house stuff is like when I've made playlists that have the more trancey stuff like typically mm. not always but typically there's portions of the songs where like the beat stops or gets extremely quiet and yeah. that's just like not fun to dance to like people don't know what to do they're like like if you watch the room people just like don't know what to do and yeah because i've typically heard the songs before i can like figure out how to dance to it but if you haven't heard the song before it's like what do i do now and with the deep house stuff um and the way they do the rhythms like usually it seems like there's like a steady rhythm throughout the whole song and then they add in like a thicker rhythm at various yeah. points when the beat drops so but at no point does a rhythm stop and so it's just like uh way more fun to dance to i think that's interesting. So I I really like the um, the lighter, almost quiet bits in trance songs, mm -hmm. particularly the ones that above and beyond do. They don't really they do this particular effect really well, mm -hmm. where they'll build up for a couple of minutes of like beat, like layer, 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 drop, layer, more stuff going on, and then just after something big happens, they like kind of everything cuts out, and there's just like a ethereal, spacey kind of like and, and a voice singing or something. Mm -hmm. And the way that I've seen that like work in clubs and at gigs is like everyone's dancing 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 getting like, tired and into it and then like they kind of like stand there and mm. sway almost like oh yeah kind of <laughs> like just being really into the fact that they were just like thrashing around mm. and now they get a chance to breathe reflect look around go like okay and kind of reset almost and then it takes them out again by by layering and building up and like taking them out again mm. um but there's something about that like, contrast that really appeals to me mm. and you're almost not meant to dance mm -hmm. i think at that point you're meant to kind of like ground a bit um mm. or maybe not ground because grounding is like the heavy you know, dancing is grounding but there's something restorative and ethereal and kind of blissful about that that interlude mm. almost that mm -hmm. i really appreciate but i can see if you want to keep people dancing um and they're not really <laughs> used to what to do at that moment or they're, they're not I'm expecting it then it's like uh, look at your what watch what's, <laughs> what's, yeah. what's going on you know i can see that it makes me think that like the placement in the set too would matter mm -hmm. of like that might be a nice thing to do um at the end or like uh at various like if you know if it's a longer set like at various mm -hmm. like every half hour or something like that yeah. where it's like oh yeah we can uh digest this but i don't know I, I mean i can part of it too is just like i can dance for several hours and so yes. like having a slower uh part in the middle it's just kind of frustrating and it's nice to have the slower stuff at the beginning and the end i yeah. think but um yeah, I, I think it depends on the shape of like how long you have and what you're going for. And yeah, yeah, but that makes sense. I like I like how you talk about that. Mm. I think the length of how long you're going for is really important because like in a two hour set, so the, the above and beyond group therapy uh, sets, the A and B sets are two hours long, mm -hmm. um, which is part of a wider like six hour long half day, basically, mm -hmm. that they, don't, mm -hmm. they don't show on, on YouTube or on the radio show. And like six hours is a lot of is a lot of dancing. Mm -hmm. um, so building in like kind of okay, this is a bit quieter, this is a, a bit like less jumping up and down dancing mm -hmm. really helps to manage your energy levels as you're going through it. That makes um, sense. Um, and similarly, I mean, they always when it's the big nights like an Anjuna night or something, the structure I've normally seen is like A and B's in the middle, and then someone like Ilan Bluestone is after them, like towards the end of the night, and he's just like full on like un unsubtle bang bang kind of like just, <laughs> you know like happy dancey whatever yeah. but that's at like four or five a.m at that yeah. point <laughs> well know, it's like okay that's that's a lot of like i need energy from you now whereas earlier on in the the the, the, the day or the evening is more like because that you can put more energy into it the music is slightly more complicated or a bit darker or it's something that doesn't you doesn't require them to give you energy because you still have some yourself. And the longer it goes on, the more it's like them giving you energy to keep going. Mm. It's one thing I've found is the as they've, they've designed the entire six hour thing or something like mm. that. That makes so much sense. It makes me wonder like how they if I well one I have to go to one of these things at some point. So good. <laughs> well, yeah. Above and beyond uh, ABGT five hundred is in LA, I think. Um, yeah, October this year, right? Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll go to that. We'll see. 
uh, I initially I thought I wouldn't be able to make it, but I think I'll be in the States probably at that point. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear like either in sets that I hear or if I go mm -hmm. in live, like where they put them throughout the set. And because um, I don't know, maybe, yeah, I'd, I could also listen to the albums that they have and see how they mm -hmm. do that. I don't know. Um, but I feel like it makes me think as well, like I've been thinking about this. There must be so much like, I'm thinking of Samo Buria and like how he talks about like knowledge transitions and like I bet the above and beyond people and all of these people like know so much stuff that I would like love to know about how they structure these events yeah. and like music sets and albums and stuff that like yeah I just don't know how I would learn except from like inference from watching them do things yeah it's a good point um I mean I've, I'm also curious about making electronic music I mean I've mm -hmm. been I'm not not DJing but the, you know the guy at the party who like takes over Spotify and like lines up songs mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. as best I can do because I had to know any DJing skills mm -hmm. um yeah there's something really fun yet yet <laughs> I like I like the way you think <laughs> um and hey now that I'm a free agent I have way more time I can start like learning yeah. this stuff um but yeah there's something really fun about pitching the the mood of the room and like okay people are kind of tired or they're energetic or they're feel or the day has been sad or happy or whatever and like how can I how can I shape this thing in response to what I think the crowd around me is wanting perhaps surprise them at times but take them on a journey that they'll leave going like wow that was that was really good music like they might not realize that you've been shaping it but it's just it lines up with with their mood or it takes them somewhere and just doing that at the scale of like 20,000 people <laughs> uh, in a, a live uh, concert or even like a radio show that you stream around the world like ABGT um, just seems like a lot of fun and you must like the amount of thought that goes into that of like okay that what's this transition precisely here like and okay well we can't do that we're gonna do this over here and then you know what's the general vibe of this part like it's so much more than just dish 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 that people are kind of <laughs> ridicule electronic music guys it's like it's way more than that there's, there's a lot totally. of thought that goes into this it makes me wonder too, like a lot of these groups seem to have like two or three people and it makes me wonder mm. like how they divide up what they're working on and like they, mm. the ones that are good, like clearly they must have some kind of like arrangement or some working yeah. knowledge where they like, no, yeah, you got this and I've got this or something like that. And I, I don't know, do you know anything about that? I, I don't think that, I don't know anything specific. I do know at least with Above and Beyond, I've seen them maybe eight or nine times mm -hmm. um in different nice. places um yeah, it's crazy um and unless it's like one of the massive um one of their biggest gigs there's normally only two of them mm -hmm. so there'll be like a different combination of two of them at different gigs i think mm -hmm. that might influence what they choose what they play or the, what the vibe is because you get different elements of their personality mm -hmm. and for the massive gigs it's all three of them i think mm -hmm. i think i've seen that um but i suspect that each of their backgrounds influences the songs in different ways. Like there's definitely different um, vibes or genres they're playing with. And I think like some of the sadder songs come from certain members when they're feeling sadder and from the happy songs of, you know, depends on their moods as well, right? So I think mm -hmm. having just a single person, it's much more difficult to have the diversity and the, the stuff from outside your perspective, right? Um, I mean, it ties in really weirdly to an essay I just wrote which is you can only respond to what you notice mm. but if you're only one person then you can't necessarily notice things that are outside of your domain and what you're outside of your current experience so your music will reflect that whereas having two or three people means that oh hey you're feeling sad I, I wasn't feeling sad at all but you're right this this album could benefit from some, mm. from some sad, uh, sadness or whatever mm. um, so I'd, I'd love to know I would love to know how they interact at that level um, mm. the kind of uh, the vibe feeling emotion level in mm -hmm. the music mm. Maybe fingers crossed one day I'll get to interview them on the podcast and yeah. talk to them. I would just love to love to interview them or, or people in that kind of position and just kind of get a download on so many things. Yeah. I mean, that would be an amazing podcast as a like a thematic podcast, right? Is find like aspiring or up and coming electronic music artists and be like, hey, what's your process? How do you do this? Mm -hmm. Um, why are you doing this? That'd be mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. What uh what 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 are you hoping to do in this direction and like what, what what do you imagine it looking like if you do go down this direction i don't know it's just always been something i've wanted to play with mm -hmm. um i think at first i was like okay i'll learn some like basic djing skills um just so i can 
basically just so I can get the transitions between songs to work. Um, because mm -hmm. annoyingly, when you have a Spotify playlist, no matter how hard you try, there's a kind of a mm -hmm. and then a new one starts, and it's just painful. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the best things about the best uh, EDM when they have like full albums of their own stuff is that they they mix everything together. So it's just basically one long mixed track, and that's a wonderful experience to to go on on that journey. It's hard to go so back once to you've heard that. Honestly, like when you there's there's one particular um, transition, I think in Anjuna Beats 11, mm. where there are two songs and the transition between them is a minute long. Mm. And Do you know I'm which like, songs? Yeah, it's um, the second one is Under Your Skin. Mm. Um, and the one before that is I can't remember the name right now. Um, mm. But yeah, it's it's just wonderful. So I think the, what it's actually a really good example of that um, the quiet bit that we were just talking about. So the one before mm -hmm. that that happens is like this enormous booming like unsubtle um jump up and down song and then it just cuts to nothing and goes into this very gentle two minute long ballad basically and then the ballad comes out with like this minute long transition into under your skin um which is just it, it's just this beautiful thoughtful well-crafted experience mm. and I'd like to be able to play with that stuff. It, again, it's difficult if you don't also produce the music, but we haven't mm. got kind of editorial control of the music. So I'm pretty sure when they make those albums, they're like, hey, artists who we've signed to our label, please change your tracks such that we can mix mm -hmm. it with this one. Which and is they a little bit of files and stuff too. Yeah, they have all that stuff. And you know, I don't think I'll ever get there. But mm. there's there's just something really appealing about letting other people feel a bit of what I feel when I listen to this music. Like, mm -hmm. and, kind of feeling that way for my own music even say hey this is something I really enjoy something that's getting me feeling a certain kind of way and I did this to myself through mm. music mm -hmm. there's <laughs> something cool about that mm. um and I guess one more thing that comes to mind is that I, I used to play music a lot as a, as a kid so I played a few instruments and that kind of went away unfortunately when I left school because it was hard to continue it so my musical like instrument skills aren't what they used to be um while on a computer at least you can spend months working on a single track and kind of bring that kind of skill set to it rather than how well you can perform a single thing once almost or you know practice one thing um and that that's something i appreciate about edm actually is that it's not the same as listening to a band obviously you, you haven't got the same kind of fluid emotion and the human element there but you do have potentially weeks months or years worth of of finessing mm -hmm. and complexity behind it. That's why I love Dead Mouse. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. have a bunch of complexity behind it that you can't replicate unless mm. with an enormous orchestra and you know whatever else. There's a lot mm. going on, um, and I really respect and appreciate that too. Mm. What is going back to this thing about like your experience listening to music? Like, how would you describe that, and what would you want to convey through making your own music? Like, what what, what qualitatively would that be like? <sighs> There's, there's an experience that I get from good EDM, which is like a buildup of some kind of tension and then release, mm. um, which happens, I think, in most music, but it's very explicit in mm. EDM, um, where it's like, we're going to give you three minutes of emotional intensity and increasing levels of uh, or mm -hmm. something, kind of this like tightness, mm. and then we're going to just let you go, almost, mm. and there's something cathartic and um, annealing to it almost <laughs> of like mm -hmm. accelerating that, that cycle of, of putting something down. Mm. Like we'll artificially turn up the pressure and then we'll let you go and then we'll do it over and over again. Mm. Uh, and there's something just interesting about that. And when, you're, when your, let's say, body mind is attuned to it and mm -hmm. to the music and you're like into it, there's something really just raw and powerful about it. Um, mm. Which I think is also when why you um, when you uh, layer in that kind of the filthy notes that we were talking mm. about earlier into that kind of context, it's like I did not expect you to go there, but that's exactly what I wanted. Oh yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, yes, more of that. Totally. I didn't know I wanted that. It's often <laughs> you know? so unexpected. Like the first time yeah. you hear a track like that, you're like, what? what yeah. Oh yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I just I, I would love to be able to play with and there's humor as well, like kind of you can throw in so many emotions just by like a weird note or a mm. sudden key change or a, a chord that's unexpected. Like mm -hmm. I did not expect to go there, but I'm, I'm kind of enjoying this. That's, mm. you know, it's, there's, there's just so much potential there for fun and playfulness that it just mm. seems like it'd be a lot of fun to do. Mm. I would love to hear 
whatever you make or <laughs> curate or DJ, like, yeah, sign me up. Oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm actually curious about your journey as well, because I've been following um, from afar. I haven't joined yet, but your, your meta um, mm -hmm. dance party. Yeah, I always say you're I, the first person I send them to. So yeah, the I've been really, exactly. I'm really enjoying your playlist. I need to make uh -huh. it to one of the dance parties one day. Uh -huh. um, but um, I'm really curious to see like what's brewing there for you, because clearly you're getting more and more into playlist design and like journey design almost for your mm -hmm. for your participants like what's what's happening there and where's it going do you think uh-huh yeah i mean i i first off i just so feel like what the pain of what you're talking about with spotify like I, i'm like <laughs> angry at them that i think they like cut out the dj interface stuff and i'm like oh this could have been so good uh yeah. what if it were nice though malcolm's yeah riff. and um exactly it's like um, you know, actually something I've done when I went, when I did the set at five camp was I like made some notes in advance about certain transitions and mm. like that there was like extended silences specifically. And I tried to pick, I try to pick songs that like go well next to each other, but if the silences or the, um, the mix make it sound weird, then you can sometimes mm. get around it by being like, yeah, at this exact moment, I'll skip ahead. And that's kind of yeah. hacky, but it does work. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, with the dance parties um for one i'm just trying to have a good time myself like i want to make yeah. a playlist that i'd love to dance to and yeah. um part of what i enjoy dancing to is sort of the aesthetics or sounds but also it's like i'm trying i am trying to do my own meta practice when i mm. dance and certain tracks are better than others for that and you know that's 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 really that it's a frustrating experience in some ways because it's sort of like, I don't know, there are like three qualities and pick two and you're yes. not going to get perfectly the thing you want. And I could, the only way to get perfectly the thing I want would be to produce my own music or um, ideally I want to, would love to like inspire or kickstart like a genre in itself where I'm not necessarily making it all myself, but it's like, yeah, mm. go, go and make the thing. Like there's a, there's a scene of people making this kind of music. Yeah. Um, but I try my best with existing tracks and um, make song like choose songs that I think do a reasonable job at the sort of it, it compromising the different mm. factors I'm looking for. And yeah, it, it seems to work out pretty well. What kind of genre are you looking to to foster here? What would it uh -huh. sound like? Be like? Yeah. Well, primarily, first and foremost, I would like it to be good for meta practice for doing meta mm -hmm. practice which like has some requirements like it the so the sound or the vibe or is the aesthetics the mood the melody the harmony have to be conducive so like this this like deep house stuff that i've been really enjoying like like is much darker than i would prefer for meta yeah. music it's like maybe maybe i like right now i'm like maybe this is sort of compassion music <laughs> but yeah, uh, even that's yeah. a that's a stretch i'm just i'm just like you know hand waving it but it's so it's so good to dance to so um yeah that's that's a requirement as well it's, it sounds good that it's fun to dance to but yeah mm. that it's for meta music and that means that the, the the sounds the 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 melodies and also the lyrics have to be conducive to meta and a lot of the stuff talks about love but it's typically romantic love that they're talking about uh yeah. And some of the lyrics you can sort of squint at and be like, yeah, you can just think that it's meta that they're talking about, but they're not. And, um, you know, there's just so much, so much effort is put into having like really good poetry, essentially about romantic mm. love. And I, yeah. you know, I'm a romantic. I am such a romantic. It's really not to disagree. I would never have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know me, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not that it's not that I don't like romantic love or something, but mm. like you could imagine the same effort going into lyrics about the Brahma Viharas, about Metta, totally. about all of that stuff and um, making allusions to things and, um, you know, having various, maybe even bits of chanting in the back or something. And like, that would be yeah. really cool. And so I would love to have stuff that sounds, I think the like easiest way to say the North Star right now would be like, something that sounds like deep house but is for meta music instead and mm. is for practicing with meta instead i mean yeah nice so it's kind of like happy kind of happy uplifting general music mm -hmm. and then occasionally like some content almost of like something to be grateful for a direction of love all that kind of thing 
um, to give you, I think, to, to concentrate on almost, um, a point of focus? Yeah, I don't know that I would just, I mean, you're not going to get into, most people aren't going to get into deep absorption states while sure. dancing. So it's more like you can do, you can feel the love in your heart and you're reminded mm. that that's possible to yeah. feel and express with your body. And that, and ideally also like you're in a room where a bunch of people are doing that and like everyone, the music and the setting and the other people yeah. are all reminding you like, Hey, we can do this. And in that way, you don't have to, um, uh, you don't have to put effort into concentrating yourself because everything in the environment just reminds you, Oh, you can do meta right now. Other people are doing it. You can ride the wave of yeah, other people doing yeah. it. I mean, it's going to be amazing when there's a room of 10, a hundred, a thousand people that are actually doing meta in the room. Like at five camp, like I was doing meta. I think people were trying hard to say for sure, but there were two mm. people that came in and out of the room several times. That was like, when they come in, the room is different. Like yeah. they, you know, they're, they're, bodhisattvas walking in and out of the room and uh i could feel it and the room was different and like i know that there's going to be a day where like i'm at a party or running a party where there's really good music for this stuff and a significant portion if not all of the people in the room are like actively doing meta and that is going to be like the world's coolest dance party ever i'm just calling it now <laughs> i i hear you i i totally get what you mean about picking up on that whatever that thing is, right? When you have a bunch of people who are doing the same thing together, it's additive. Mm -hmm. um, I found this with AT with the trainees. I was mm -hmm. like, holy crap, there's something going on in here. There's like almost too much. Can I turn it down, guys, mm -hmm. turn it down. So I can't deal with that much. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, cultivating that with intention and via like something you can dance to would be really powerful to like get further into it somehow and channels it out into the world almost there's mm -hmm. something I, I find with meta and meditation practices is that you're just sat there I mean you can move you do you know dancing meditation and then various kind of um so did I say that did I say dancing it's just generally moving meditation you, you mm -hmm. kind of walk and that kind of thing mm -hmm. um and that's cool like that's a way of taking what you feel and like expressing it into the world like a kind of a, a conduit into the world whereas mm -hmm. just sitting there feeling good about yourself and like, on a cushion like mm -hmm it doesn't quite feel like it's manifesting it in quite the same way. Mm. So getting a big concert hall or whatever, just a group of people all participating mm -hmm. actively, dynamically, feels like it'll be way more powerful than just sitting there together, doing method together somehow, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, that's so well said. And I think like, I think increasingly the way I think about it, it's like meta practice. Yeah, it's, this sort of door in for people is like, oh, you can feel mm. happy, right? Like, that's good. And like, I'm all about that. That's like a big part of why I practice. But yeah. at the end of the day, the reason that I teach it and that I focus mm. on spreading it is that if you really dive into it, it should change how you show up in the world, how you express mm. yourself, the choices you make, the way you interact with people, you know, the life choices you make, who yeah. you are, you know? And it should, it's like, you should feel it in the body and then express it through your actions and your life. Yes. And dance is, especially this collective dance, is mm. such a leverage point for doing that at scale, where it's like, yes, not only are we feeling this in our body, but we are expressing it with our bodies together. And we know that that's what we're doing. And that, that um, I mean, it's easy for me to get like poetic about this, but like, I think that just Yeah, I had this experience at the vibe camp set where it was like it went better than I thought like objectively on the sort of levels mm -hmm. you'd expect like more people coming and enjoying it but then it went better on a practice dimension than I expected where it was like I could see that it was I'm just going to say this poetically and try uh -huh. to like transpose this to less poetic language somehow or like in how you hear it but it's like I could see that it was like shaking the fabric of the cosmos to like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have that dance party, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like the love was rippling out mm -hmm. from that place in a way that yeah. I could feel and sense, but not really articulate very well. Uh, yes. And, that, and, well, and this was about, just day yeah. one, you know, it's just day one <laughs> of doing this kind yeah. of thing. It's, it's the thing about articulation is it always misses the point. Mm -hmm. um, kind of by definition, almost that the thing that happens is, I'm not going to say beyond words, but is not containable by words. That's why mm -hmm. poetry is the only way we can manage it because poetry isn't about the words, it's about the feeling you get while experiencing the poetry. Mm. Um, so 
yeah, I hear you. Um, mm-hmm. And okay. the only way to communicate that, ironically, is to do it more. Yes. <laughs> is you yeah. can say, hey, you need to come to this dance party that I went to. because It's so good. I felt like love, radio. Ah, mm-hmm. forget it. Just come in. You have to experience it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm picturing some kind of like scene here, mm-hmm. kind of like um, Tashin's version of Five Rhythms or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where it's just like, yeah, there's this online thing. It's like once a week radio show and everyone gets together and like they dance and there's live mm-hmm. events and, um, you know, there's every couple of weeks there's like a real one somewhere and like that uh-huh. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. One of the best things that came out of Five Camp for me personally was um, my friend Katie Devaney, who I just had on the podcast, um, Mm -hmm. fascinating person, really good friend of mine. And also she's helping to start the Berkeley Olympic, which is like a new meditation center in Berkeley. Nice. And I was telling her, as like, as you know, I was like, oh, I have this hope to maybe do a club one day. And then as I was thinking about that last year, I was like, oh, you know what? this is going to be logistically like such a high challenge level to run a club. I don't know if I actually want to do that. It's like, maybe it would be better to just rent places and mm. go to places short term. But like what I need is somewhat specific, right? Because I want to have a room where you can do a talk and a guided meditation with yeah. cushions and then transition to a different room where there's a sound system and a dance floor and like you can actually dance together. Yes. And that's, that's kind of a very specific order. In any case, the Berkeley Olympic is going to be perfect for this. I checked it out. It's, Mm -hmm. it's like just what the doctor ordered for this. And so I can do an event there and I'm hoping to do at least one event there this year and try it out and see how that goes. Yeah. Nice. That's so cool. How, how big are your events or do you want them to be? How many people will Mm. be in the room? Well, we'll see how big this event is when I do it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can imagine it being really any scale that a venue could Mm. occasion. I mean, um, I imagine this event will be something like 20 to 100 when I run it this year. Uh, nice. Uh, so yeah, that seems like a good size to aim for. It was probably like 30 or 40 people at the Vibe Camp set, something like mm. that. So there's something about uh, live music, live events, which are kind of intimate. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I've been to the massive ones, like five, ten thousand people, whatever. Mm-hmm. I was like, it is too many people um, mm-hmm. at a certain point. Like it works, mm-hmm. but it's also like kind of industrial. Like mm-hmm. it's like you pushed over there and then do this and like get patted down and then go over there and that kind of thing. Mm. Whereas like the smaller ones, like, you know, some a basement club or something, it's like one, 200 people. Um, it feels very like cozy and like you can make friends there and you can like mm. have conversations and the sound system isn't like amazing, but it's good enough and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and I can really see what you're doing, what you're talking about working at that scale to, to start with. And so it's like what you're doing in Berkeley is exactly yeah. that. It's just like, it yes. feel really like just cozy and um, connected to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and after a certain scale, it becomes like, they're just other people and it's mm-hmm. hard to see them as like potential friends almost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, totally. awesome. I'm really excited. I wish I could be there. Yeah, well, I'll let you know when it is and maybe we can get you to America one of these days. <laughs> nice. Yeah, for this. yeah, I would like that. I would like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm. it's annoying that i can't make it actually um i probably could have made it but the paths have taken me back towards europe and then on to southeast asia so i see a I long see. way off from the us unfortunately gotcha how has the sort of nomading been for you i mean your last time we spoke on the podcast you're in the uk and now you're in mexico how, how's that been for you it's been it's been good i've been in mexico now for about three months two weeks left um mm-hmm. and it's been so nice to just live in a different way first of all like, I lived mm-hmm. in London for 15 years mm. right and when I left it it was like for a week or two here and there for holidays and stuff right it was never worth this. I think three weeks was the longest time I left mm-hmm. um and now it's just like oh I live in Oaxaca for a month and now I live in Merida for a month and uh, traveling around on you know Mexican buses it's like mm-hmm. it's just even at that level of having a different way of living is valuable mm. um but beyond that just um just getting away from the routine um trying new foods and enjoying new weather and like swimming in the, the sunlight sea, all that kind of stuff oh my god the sun <laughs> um yeah the sun is the sun is something special i've now realized that i i need to live somewhere sunny um doesn't need to be hot particularly not this hot this is too, <laughs> this is, this is too hot now um it's funny even even here in merida um when we told other Mexicans in other places that we were coming here in April, they were like, <laughs> it's so hot there. <laughs> and this is like Mexicans wow. in hot places. Like, yeah, they're right as well. It's, uh-huh. it's too hot. Too um, but uh, I now, I, th- I think I'm, basically what I'm doing is I'm looking, what kind of life do I want to settle in afterwards? 
Mm. Um, might be London, it might not be, but like, what is it that I want? Mm. And sunshine and more warmth. Basically, the, being able to go outside mm. is really important to me. Mm. And then in London, apart from the weather being like not amazing most of the time, there's also lots of like apartment blocks and that kind of thing. So the only way to get outside is very often put your shoes and coat on, go out, go down some stairs, go out in a busy main road with traffic, and then like you're outside. But it's not a nice way of being outside. Mm. Whereas here, I can just like open a door in a garden, mm. right? And open a door on a terrace. Like, okay, th there's something about the use of outside as part of my living space that really appeals to me. Mm. And that's very difficult to do um, in places that have climates that aren't really suited for it. But I would love to have the, like outdoor rooms, if you like, um, that I can use, like work outside, have an outside standing desk would be mm. ideal for mm. me. Have my feet on the grass and, <laughs> <laughs> and stand in the sun or shade if I have to, but that kind of thing would be amazing. Mm. Um, so yeah, just learning stuff like that about myself that I couldn't live here because it's too hot, but definitely want to move in this direction of, yeah, picking my environment to suit how I want to feel, basically. Mm. It, it sounds like from the way you're talking about it, that you're sort of planning to do this nomad journey for a while and then maybe pick a place to settle down that f fits your needs is that right or not sure yet or yeah kind of mm -hmm. um it's like people kind of ask me when are you going home mm -hmm. and I'm like well currently I am home because I uh -huh. don't have a home yes <laughs> like, yeah this is same. home yeah where, where do you live oh right here yes um, same. Same. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a strange one I still see London as home uh -huh. um but like spiritual home or like kind of just familiar home rather mm -hmm. than the place I live now so mm -hmm. whatever um but yeah, so we're going on to Budapest in Hungary after mm. after this, after a brief stint in London, and then hopefully on to Bali. Mm. Um, I'm hoping to hang out with Johnny Miller and, and some people out there for a while. Wonderful. Um, and just to see what that's like. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the idea would be experience it like more ways of being and then be like, okay, what way of being do I like? What way of being suits me? Mm. Um, particularly because in London, at least, you kind of get caught up in... The general vibe of the place mm. um and it's it's hard to push against that i find mm -hmm. um even when i quit my job and went self-employed it was it was hard to slip into oh i'm doing self-employed london mode mm. it was still kind of it felt pressured all of my mm. friends were working normal working hours and all that kind of stuff right mm -hmm. so it wasn't like oh i have complete freedom it's i have complete freedom within the cultural constraints of this place mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. so i think what my partner and i were looking for is what kind of lifestyle what kind of constraints do we want almost mm. and then find a place that maps onto those constraints mm. to some extent and there's also the yeah it seems like one of the constraints is sunlight so it's like sunlight. might not be returning to london <laughs> who knows uh, i think we might what we might do is end up like having a in my ideal world when i have mm. loads of money um is have like um a place in london for most of the year and then just when it gets dark for winter it's like mm -hmm. go to the i don't know northern spain or something or italy mm -hmm. or something like that um just because i struggle to deal now with four months of winter in the uk mm -hmm. it's just too dark and gray mm -hmm. it's actually and this is getting quite nerdy now but like it's i don't mind it when it's like sunshine in winter and cold which mm -hmm. happens sometimes like it's really bright but it's mm -hmm. cold fine I'm, I'm good with that mm -hmm. the uk has a very particular kind of gray thing mm -hmm. that it does where it's just you don't see the sky for a month mm -hmm. Um, it's just like consistently flat there's mm. no like contour or color in the, in the sky it's just mm. gray <laughs> and that that I can't deal with mm. anymore I just can't do it <laughs> it's funny that you say that because we've talked about but I'm, I, I certainly have seasonal affective disorder and um, yeah me it too. seems like the exact opposite for me of like if I had okay. to pick one I'd pick warmth <laughs> like okay uh, I, I don't know like I definitely like the sun I would want the sun but if I had to pick one I'd probably choose warmth yeah okay, interesting yeah yeah no for me it's brightness uh -huh. i think i need, yeah. I need brightness mm -hmm. um i think because warmth i can i can warm up inside but indoors i can't i don't like using very bright artificial lights mm. to kind of get my lumens in mm. um but the sun is like even landing here in february was mm -hmm. like recharging like mm -hmm. ah ding okay <laughs> <laughs> totally <laughs> you know? um so yeah i i think I hear you though. I mean, the cold does get oppressive, particularly again when you just can't go outside, um, or where it's kind of cold and a bit rainy and like just really do I? I don't want to go out. <laughs> that, that kind of vibe. Like I don't want that vibe. Maybe. Yeah, I think it got drilled in me at a certain point when I started. I started doing standing meditation and now tai chi as well. And like mm. and, and dance, of course, is like um, 
with the internal martial arts and the those contemplative practices, it's like better to do them outside. And I think actually meditation mm. too, but I've mostly done meditation inside, like seated formal meditation. And yeah. um, you know, if it's cold, I don't want to do it outside. Same with dancing. I just it mm. seems like being warm in my body, even to start. I mean, it does warm up your body, but just like yeah. It's, I think it's almost like a womb thing of like, you feel comfortable and safe. And if you're yeah. not feeling that way, it's like hard to dance or express yourself, uh, at least for me. Yeah, I know what you mean. And, and going back to the using outdoors as a, a space that you can use, mm -hmm. um, rather than like a thing you go for a walk in, especially mm -hmm. almost, um, requires certain temperature. Mm -hmm. So I would love to work outside, exercise outside, mm -hmm. meditate outside all the things outside mm -hmm. you just, just just like spend as much time outside as i can basically mm -hmm. and yeah warmth is required for that if it's mm -hmm. like yeah i'm wearing a coat and it's <laughs> frizzling like yeah really enjoying uh -huh. this <laughs> not yeah. not loving this totally so I, th I think unfortunately i think the ideal for me is like california weather I, uh -huh. i'm told i've only been there once but like yeah um just kind of nice all the time just mm. like nice <laughs> lucky me i'm there right now yeah. so are you in california oh, yeah okay. yeah <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be leaving tomorrow or the, okay. this week, but um, yeah, I mean, I've been in California for the last couple of weeks. So am I right in the assessment of the weather just being like nice most of the time, just generally good? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, I am in the Bay and like there's specific parts of the Bay that are maybe more like windy than you'd expect mm. or like cold or um, things like that. But um, in general, yeah, it's just like warm and sunny here. And yeah. sometimes it's like rainy and warm, but I don't, I don't mind mm. that as much. And uh yeah, love California weather for sure. Yeah, I remember I was staying in San Francisco for a couple of weeks and it was like foggy and cold and just crap. Mm. And then I, I I got on an Uber like an hour down the <laughs> bay into like to a Stanford, I actually went to Stanford. And I was uh -huh. like, this is paradise. Uh -huh. yeah, it's not <laughs> this far. is just, yeah. this is perfect. Uh -huh. There's nothing, I, I just love everything about this entire mm -hmm. like climate. It's mm -hmm. like I was made for this climate. Uh -huh. And then SF was just like, what the hell is this foggy nonsense? Uh -huh. Totally. <laughs> So, that yeah. was that was actually how I figured out that I had seasonal affective disorder because last winter, not this winter, but last winter, I was in Massachusetts and Vermont mm -hmm. and a bit of New York State for several weeks and like was going through a really difficult period, lots of difficult stuff happening. I was like deciding whether to leave the monastery or not. And then mm -hmm. I like flew out to California and was in California for like six or eight weeks. And like the day that I got in California, I just immediately right. felt better. Um yeah. This happened when I went, I went to Arizona for a week earlier this year. I had been in Massachusetts for the holidays and, with my family. And um, just like even getting in the airport in Arizona, it was warmer. And I was like, oh, yeah. like, oh, it's just yeah. better. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I know it's really exactly. It's, it's, it's a really difficult one because I love London. I love my friends there. I love that, the, like, London is an incredible city. Mm -hmm. And I'm saddened that I, I think it's difficult to live there if you care about climate unfortunately mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because it's one of the nice like the southeast of england is like nicer weather like sunnier drier that kind of thing but it's just a lot of gray and meh a lot mm -hmm. of the time mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. yeah it's going to be like probably moving somewhere else unfortunately mm -hmm. that's quite hard to get into the u.s mm -hmm. um as a non-american so <laughs> i believe that i'm not not sure it's going to be there but we'll see somewhere sorry about that we'll try to fix that for you thank get you michael Thanks. ashcroft Please. to the united states <laughs> we need to yeah, start like a pac or something let's uh hyperstition this into existence uh -huh. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah mm. Mm. where are you going next I'm going to do a retreat in the Pacific Northwest for about a nice. week, and then I'll be in cool. Seattle. I will meet our friend James Stuber for the first time in Very person. Cool. I've been friends with him for, yeah. I think, five years, and I've not met him in person yet. So. I thought you'd met each other because you've done yep. the, the digital productivity coach together and other projects and things. I, I have been on did. countless Zoom calls with this friend, <laughs> uh, good, good friend James, and have not yet met him, so I'm excited about Amazing. that. Yeah. I love how that's a thing now, how like you can have friends you just haven't met at mm -hmm. this point mm -hmm. and, and it's just more and more normal almost uh -huh. yeah. i think it might be more normal in our scene particularly on twitter yeah. but um still yeah it's, it's no longer kind of you're not friends until you've met like that nonsense. Uh -huh. not nonsense yep yep and you and i have yet to meet so it will happen one day hyperstition yeah hyperstition it will definitely yeah. happen i mean life is long Life is long. <laughs> so yeah. unless happen. you die we could die today could happen that's true i will do my best not to do that yeah let's try not <laughs> to die yet okay yeah
Mm. I actually wanted to ask you about your travels because I, I, I'm currently a nomad, right? I, I mm -hmm. do nomading because that's just the word. But you describe yourself as a pilgrim. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious to hear more about your, like, yeah, you're not nomad, but pilgrimaging almost. What's, yeah. What does that mean to you? Hmm. Well, um, you know, I had, I had done a few walking pilgrimages before, and that's something I'd written about, like as a spiritual practice, basically. And the way that I do walking pilgrimages, um, I don't, it's not like, oh, the Camino or, oh, you're on the pilgrimage to Mecca. There's no destination. It's mm. rather like you start out and you start walking and then you get to a fork in the road. You're like, do I go left or do I go right? And right. you're like, left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and, and that skill of deciding which way to go. Well, one, you can practice that in many ways through a pilgrimage of like, I, I call it for myself, like internally, like trusting. It's like, mm. There's, there's no logical answer to whether to go left or right if you don't have a destination. Mm. Um, but there is somehow, you can put on the lens, shall we say, that there is an answer that's non-logical and mm. like practice finding it. And um, that's a skill that you can practice on pilgrimage that I've practiced. And then you can use all of the time in life, like yeah. trusting, shall we call it. And um yeah, and so it was sort of natural for me to want to do something similar to that. I've also been traveling a lot, like, as a way of life for the past few years. You know, I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time in Vermont and California and Massachusetts. Um, but when I left the monastery, it was like, at first I was like, oh, I'm going to get a job and a car and an apartment. And I'd done that before when I because I'd left the monastery previously and, like, got an apartment and got a car mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, worked various jobs and stuff, but um, this time around, I was like, no, I, I don't think so. So, um, yeah, I, I asked around for people that were willing to put me up and let me stay with them, and um, you know, started my Patreon. So that's that's mm. how I'm supported financially now. And between those two things, like having my Patreon and living with people that are willing to put me up for free, um, mm -hmm. I can make that work financially and. I stay with people for something like, I'd say anywhere from one night to six weeks. I, pr I prefer like a month or six weeks when I can, but yeah. um, especially because I have to schedule things like this. But um, so it's different than the walking pilgrimages that I've done. Um, you know, I'm not on foot. Um, I, I fly places, I drive places, but I don't, I, you know, I'm basically voluntarily homeless right now and mm. um, go from place to place and, uh, that seems to be a good, a good way of life for me. And, and I guess importantly, I'd say this feels like my path to being of service in the world right now is, mm. is involves going from place to place and not staying in one place, but, you know, meeting lots of different people, connecting with them, helping mm. them if I can, learning from them, uh, you know, becoming better friends with them. Um, and then, you know, there's increasingly an effect of like my, my network is growing. So, you know, yeah. I can connect the people that I know and that's having lots of really good second order effects, I think. So, um, mm. you know, a lot of people talk about like finding the right city to live in or something. And it's like, yeah, there's a reason for that. But for me, I'm like, it feels almost like, like a Johnny Appleseed kind of thing of like, I can connect a lot of dots that might not be connected otherwise. Mm -hmm. Just for my benefit, what's Johnny Appleseed? I don't get the reference there. Oh, okay. This is like an American myth. So you had a Britishism. I had an American myth here. <laughs> We're at one, one for cultural. Cool. Uh, nice. Things. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a myth about a guy that uh, wanders from place to place and plants seeds for mm -hmm. apple trees in the ground. And, uh, that's, that's the basic gist of the idea. And that like, okay. uh, the forests are from Johnny Appleseed. And I think there's more in the actual story, but that's, that's the basic <laughs> idea. B busy man. Yeah. Busy uh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds like the, like a, a key frame in the pilgrimage thing is one of service. Mm -hmm. So like where I'm traveling around to travel around, it's almost for its own sake. Just like I'm doing traveling right now. Mm -hmm. I haven't got the kind of where can I, where or how can I be of service? Maybe at some point I'll switch to that, but it sounds like your pilgrimage is very much framed around service um, as well as your own needs at the same time, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think it, yes. And also like the way I, would frame that and the way I experience it is I feel like increasingly I feel like this is like the number one thing I want to be talking about in the world mm. and like demonstrating and sharing is like I try to pick with the pilgrimage I try to pick the place to go to next 
that seems to be of most benefit, but that's both of benefit to others and the world. And ideally the person I'm staying with, I, mm. I, I really think that it helps people that I stay with them um, in a, a variety of ways, but also yep. that it helps me and that I enjoy it. So it's like not disconnected from my own enjoyment. Mm. In fact, it's, it's essential that I enjoy it and that I myself yeah. benefit from it. So it's like, I can be of best service in the world to others if I am myself receiving yes. maximum joy and participating yeah. in maximum joy. So it's almost like I, it's almost like I'm an effective altruist, but instead of like a lot of the, met, I don't know what metrics they use, but like my metric is like maximum joy for me plus maximum benefit to others in the world. And I want to yeah. like, those are two variables that I want to optimize for. Yes, that makes sense. It kind of makes me think that the whole body search for path or ideal includes yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not yes. just for everyone else. It's like all beings, hang on, all beings. <laughs> and that includes me. Exactly. <laughs> actually, yes. it, it's it starts so from to, me. It starts from you. Exactly. This is the thing I find fascinating about matter in general is the traditional instructions I think are always like yourself first mm -hmm. and then further and further out more distant. Mm -hmm. Whereas the westernized version of that is start with someone you can find easy to love and then yourself last almost. Mm -hmm because mm -hmm. we find it hard to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like I can I could easily read the body thought for vow as reduce suffering for all others mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. at, at personal sacrifice. Yes. Almost. I'm like, no, 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 no that no, might no, not no. be the point actually. No, <laughs> yeah. no please don't, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wrong way, yeah. That's a, it's a very Protestant backgroundy kind of way of viewing things. It's like I must suffer so that uh -huh. they can all be happy or something or that we can all benefit. Like that doesn't make any sense. If everyone did that, we were just suffering. <laughs> and, and and it's also not just like um not only would that be a sacrifice for your own joy but but it would be so that's like counterproductive on like an energy level or something mm. of like oh you're sacrificing your own joy but but even like essentially it seems to me that the thing that is of most service to the world is the thing that brings you the most joy yeah like they're not yeah, yeah. separate so yeah. your joy is like an internal compass for the service that you have to give the world and mm. where there's one, there is the other. And if you remove one, then you remove the other. So if you were yeah. deeply unhappy, like you wouldn't be serving the world, you know, not, totally. not just because you'd be unhappy, but because you couldn't give the thing that makes you're, you're you so accessing happy. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's also going a bit further. It's like a non-dual argument as well, which is like, if I am unhappy and I am equivalent to all this, then mm. all this isn't happy really. Mm. Like I, it, I, tr I need to reflect the universe can reflect what I am. Mm. And that needs to be happy. Otherwise, it can't be happy, so to totally. speak, right? There's something in there, which I'm struggling to articulate, but there's a, yeah, a, a kind of a dissociation between self and the world, mm -hmm. if you assume that how I feel doesn't matter, ultimately. Mm -hmm. It's about how mm -hmm. all of that matters. And I think there's something to be said about the effective altruist link there that you mentioned as well. It's like, I, I don't know, but I suspect some people in that community are kind of, I will suffer as long as I can help more people. Mm -hmm. Like, that doesn't quite seem like the frame I'd want to encourage. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's just totally. a vibe I have. Just a yeah. I'd rather people be happy and then help others be happy. That seems like it's straightforward <laughs> way totally. of being. And also, I mean, there's just such a um I mean, this is the metaphor I always use, but initially when I thought of like service or being of benefit in the world, I like I think deep down I associated that with the mood that I felt when I had to volunteer at a soup kitchen in middle school. Mm. I was like, I had to. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's like good to help people to eat. Like, I think that's great. And I like having to, I didn't want to be there. Like, oh, it felt awful. And, um, you know, I'd probably enjoy that more now, honestly. I think I would yeah. probably, I would choose to now, right? But I didn't choose to at the time. And it, so it was just this feeling of like being forced to and not wanting to be there and like, um, yeah, there, it's like, because of that, it's like, I think there's like a pre, well, one, there's this sense of sacrifice, but there's also like a, a suite of like scripts of what it means to be of service. Like, oh, I should probably be doing cancer research or helping the poor or, yeah. you know, this kind of thing. And it's like, well, maybe that's not the thing that you, I mean, like, you know, your course, mm -hmm. you know, no, nobody, nobody said, oh, Michael, go and make your course. And yet it's helping so many people mm -hmm. all of the time. It's like, that's not a prescribed thing that anyone told you about beforehand or you know but that's what you found and that is what's helping so many people that's actually a really interesting path there because i worked in climate changey low carbon innovation stuff for 10 years mm -hmm. and did a degree in that and i felt like that was my cause right that's my mission of 
helping to reverse climate change and creating a better future. And like, yes, that's really important. But I wasn't happy in the process of doing that stuff. And that was a very difficult thing for me to go through. I'm like, look, this is a very noble, worthwhile cause, but I'm suffering in the pursuit of mm -hmm. supporting it in some mm -hmm. way. Now I'm feeling like I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing, but I feel like I've sometimes I feel like I've kind of gone backwards on the, the usefulness almost mm. like, well, I'm not mm -hmm. working on one of the most important things in the world. Mm. I could have more utility over there. Mm. I don't necessarily think that um, because they're, I'm replaceable over there. I'm less replaceable what I'm doing now, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but it was a weird thing to navigate of letting go of the thing that oriented my, my meaning dash contribution, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and now I have to kind of figure out what is that new thing. Mm. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a very strange one. But just the recognition that there's no point. I only have one life and I'm not prepared for it to be unhappy in the pursuit of a, a noble cause that makes me unhappy to work in, in the, the way I'm currently working. In. I might, I probably will go back into it one day, but it will be in a very different frame mm. that will make me happy at the same time as doing good. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems to me as well that like you, I mean, you seem to have the opportunity to still work on that issue, but from a different vantage point. Like, I mean, we talked about this with climate mm -hmm. stuff on the last episode, if I recall correctly. And like, yeah. there's, there's an awareness component and a cultural component of yeah. that problem that like you are uniquely suited to look at and help address in a way that like you might not have been uniquely suited to work on yeah. before. Yeah. It's interesting actually that you put it that way because I mean, you know about um, David Perel's idea of the personal monopoly, right? We have mm -hmm. these unique intersection of skills and experiences and personality and that kind of thing. And I think before I could have carved out like a, a workable monopoly in energy stuff, right? Here's my, my niche is energy networks, my background is innovation and whatever, like in this location, that is a perfectly respectable thing, but it's quite, I don't wanna say small scale, but it's limited in its scope. What seems to be happening now is that I'm combining all of that as a component with all the awareness stuff, let's call it over here, and forming like a higher order, bigger mm. monopoly almost. I'm like, huh, okay, that's interesting. I had to let go of the local uh, personal monopoly to unlock access to the much bigger mm -hmm. um, personal monopoly. And I wonder if that'll keep going mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, yeah. to see like what's what's the highest order uh -huh. personal monopoly I can know I'm still like, bringing all of myself to it and doing good with it ultimately yes um, but yeah going back to that stuff after say a few years of doing this stuff and mm -hmm. I'm combining them that sounds like it could be worthwhile I think and more mm -hmm. powerful than just me doing more like advising corporates and their strategies which mm -hmm. is good and fine and useful but there are many people out there who can do that just as well if not much better than I could so mm -hmm. meh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Well, I, I, I mean, it's your life, but I'm over here. I'm hoping that that <laughs> continues to be like a, an arc of the Michael Ashcroft journey is well, working on the climate and the environment and stuff in that yeah. way that like feels good and isn't suffering yes. for you and, you know, and also genuinely helps, helps the world. So, hmm. yeah, uh, I feel like, I, I feel like whenever I describe this, it's almost like, I, it feels like this is one of the most acute places where I hit up the limits of language because it's like the hmm. words that I find just feel so dissatisfactory for expressing my felt experience of this idea and what it's like to live a life based on this. It's like, yeah, it's just like using the word service. It like weights too mm. heavily towards others or talking about joy, it weights too heavily towards yourself. I mean, my teacher would talk about a vow, like that's the, the union of this. Mm. Um, but even that, that, you know, that, that has its own problems of like being somewhat eclectic or specific or technical. And yeah, there's something hear, there about the limits. I hear vow and hear like, I hear vow as like sacrifice and constraint mm -hmm. when I hear vow. I, yes. what I, I, what I'm, what I'm not, I know I'm missing personally in vow is wholehearted commitment and giving yourself into something which is you know, liberating, I'm sure in many ways that I can't conceptualize, but I hear it as more like constraining than I do as a good thing. But you know, that's just my own preconception, I think. Yeah. And the connotations that are floating around around it, like there's a whole, mm. there's almost a whole, the way he would use it, there's a whole different suite of connotations that are just so specific to the, his teachings. And like, I mean, it's, I think it's actually a pretty old Buddhist concept and even across religions, there's some, mm. you know, I mean, um, the Christians would talk about a vocation, for example, you yeah. know, that's a similar, similar idea. And I mean, I think the closest thing in contemporary English is maybe like purpose, your purpose, but then that yeah. has that has sort of connotations as well that are included. It's like, oh, not quite that either. Yeah. Um, 
I think this is probably why the term ikigai has come up so often, mm. even though I don't like it as a frame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems too contrived. Yeah. Um, but we are we are kind of culturally searching for language and borrowing from other people's languages um, to kind mm. of capture this thing that we just don't have words for. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not one of those people who believes that the absence of a word means that you can't feel or experience something. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. means it's it's hard to talk about and it's kind of ambiguous and hard to pin down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> interestingly there isn't there is an argument that that's a good thing mm -hmm. um looking at the frame from kind of left and right hemisphere perspective mm -hmm. almost like once you've categorized something become it loses its magic almost it's like mm -hmm. oh i've categorized it it's it's a, i've labeled labeled done that's it mm -hmm. whereas once something is uh, undefined and ambiguous and kind of fuzzy that's almost more alive mm -hmm. i think you're seeing it more directly mm -hmm. than once you categorize it and then you just see a category ultimately mm. making assumptions and simplifying over there mm -hmm. um, once you have a word for it almost mm. i don't know there's something in that of staying in the unfamiliar ambiguity that makes something more real mm. somehow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's no word for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well this is a strategy yeah there's like a there's like a rhetorical strategy i've been taking recently of just like um almost yeah like run on sentences or poetic language yeah. or something where it's like if you just use more words in an interesting order then you can yeah. uh like a good example of this actually is my sexuality tweet where i was like mm. uh you know like i i always i always think about my sexuality it's like well from some angles i'm just pretty straightforwardly straight and it's like well but i also feel like the word pansexual sort of comes in but like that also yeah. doesn't do it some people said that what i described would work with heteroflexible but i'm like oh that doesn't feel it either it's like instead i shall have a run-on sentence to describe yes. <laughs> what my sexuality is and i like it that way it's like this yeah. is more correct than any one word that i've ever yeah. found and no i will not just use the word heteroflexible or straight like fuck that i'm gonna use this tweet which has a yes. run-on sentence in it yeah please see this tweet for my, <laughs> my what i am i don't know yes. yeah for how the i am tweets have already come in handy my friend yeah yeah. I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i i've taken to doing something similar it's i don't do one of sentences i i now do more what um mark does meditation stuff on twitter mm. like just like more dashes and like mm. slang, kind of like using multiple words in the space of one word, mm. <laughs> almost uh -huh. kind of uh -huh. explicitly saying it's not this word; it's one of these five smashed together. Yeah, <laughs> but read it as one, yes. almost. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, just because I, I don't want to be pinned down to this word. This is not the right word. I can't find the right word. I'm acknowledging that it's a mix of these five words. Deal with it, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of thing, which you can do in somewhere informal, like you know, on Twitter or something. It's harder to do in formal writing. Mm -hmm. um, in, in in formal writing, I'll kind of have longer sentences and mm -hmm. you know caveat myself <laughs> and kind of go meta and say this is not what I mean but paragraph uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? um, but yeah it's annoying that we can't we can't quite pin these things down but like I was saying before I, I worry that if we could mm -hmm. they would lose their magic somewhat mm -hmm. like if you could find the exact word for your sexuality mm -hmm. I think you would find your sexuality less interesting right somehow right right to some extent yes well and ultimately also with this I, maybe this is true for all such concepts but with this particular concept it feels like at the end of the day, the real way to express it is your life. Like mm. the way I live my life is the expression of what I'm talking about. That's the true yeah. expression of it. And like, you know, the choices I make on a day to day basis or how I show up in a conversation or, mm. you know, on a long enough arc, like what, um, you know, historians might say about me or someone else like it's like mm. how, how you how you interpret that thing it's like who is a person how do they show up in the world on, on a on a moment to moment scale you know like having a conversation eating with someone but also just like what was their life and who are they and mm. how do I interpret this and I almost think at that level it's like one's life is a piece a piece of art you know it's an expression and like we're artists you know I think fundamentally mm. I'm an artist of being alive and I want to express a certain thing through being alive that's that's discovered it's dynamic it's over time it's not like oh there's this one paragraph I have to write really well yeah. it's like no the whole every every scale every moment of the whole life should express that mm, I love that it makes me think about something a, a while ago I kind of had this riff I guess um that art is made of constraints mm. right so when you paint or the oil and canvas it's not that you're just being constrained by the oil and canvas is that your art is literally made of oil and canvas mm. um, and that applies to to all art really so when you say that life is art 
I almost want to ask like, what is the stuff from which the, the art is made? Mm. Like what is the, the, the canvas and the oil um, mm -hmm. of life that we can sculpt and mold and, and do stuff to, right? It's, it's not quite qualia, it's not just experiences, but there's some almost tangible substance mm -hmm. <laughs> that you can shape, that you can craft something out of mm -hmm. with the pieces of your life, with the, the thing that I'm pointing at that I haven't got a word for. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of stuff that isn't that, mm -hmm. <laughs> I suspect. Mm -hmm. And I think, I wonder if a big part of life is figuring out like, what is the stuff of life that is worth making art out of? And what is like taxes, for example, that, yeah, <laughs> not such a thing to worry about almost. Mm. It's, yeah. it's interesting that you say that because I feel like the more I see things this way, the more something even like taxes is itself yeah, the stuff of life. Enough. It's like, yeah. there's this thing yeah. my teacher would say of like, the way you do anything is the way you do anything uh if mm. we, the way you do something the way you do anything is we do everything i think the way, yeah. yeah that's it there we go yeah and it's like the example that would always come up at the monastery is like the way you put your shoes away you know mm. like you could just lay them there or you can like nicely put them side by side so they're tucked yeah. into the thing it's like that demonstrates yeah like every action you take tells a story about who you mm. are and so like the way you do your taxes is yeah. like an opportunity to tell yourself a story about who you are and you know the way you show up in a conversation or mm. um, walk down the street or anything, even banal, small, insignificant, like is the stuff of that story as far as I can tell. Yeah, it's an interesting challenge back to my point. I mean, you're right, the, the taxes point is very much part of life because there's a, there's a tendency in, I think all of us to say that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. That's not part of life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this is this important thing that I've done it's important is part of life and that's completely wrong. Um, I remember when I was practicing Zen more than I am now, um, part of the daily life practice is stuff like put cutlery away such that you can't hear it mm -hmm. kind of thing. So that mm -hmm. you're so present to it that there's no clacking. There's no like door slamming. Mm -hmm. Like I think they said that any like loud banging noises in your kitchen is a, a message from the universe that you're not paying attention, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I found that constraining in a sense, in the sense that what if I don't want to live such that everything is quiet? What if I'm mm. intentionally being loud, <laughs> almost? But there's the intention behind it. Like if if how I put my shoes away is by hurling them across the room into the corner, and that's what I want, that's how I want my life to mm -hmm. be, that should be okay, mm -hmm. almost. But as long as I'm aware of the fact that how I'm doing that is also how I'm doing my taxes, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>? uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, there's definitely truth in the well, the, the shoe pit doesn't matter, right? That's not my life, so I'll, mm -hmm. I'll be careless here. Mm -hmm. But if I'm being careless there, I'm also going to be careless in my relationships and in my work and in my, my attending to the world. Um, and that's a shame. That's mm -hmm. not how I want to live. Yeah, it seems like you, like you could like carelessly, um, you could, uh, yeah, you could put your shoes away in a way that looks sloppy but like the way the attention that you bring to that is careful and present. Yeah, and then exactly. you could choose to do your taxes in a tidy manner, but you're still attending to it in the same way. Yeah. So you can still make, I think you can make different choices about how you show up, mm. but, um, and we all do that, but it, that's the, the quality of mind that you bring to something uh, is, is what's fundamentally important. And, and the constraints on something like the shoes or, mm. you know, things like that is like helpful for a gauge, but like ultimately, there's a weird thing where like these things both matter and don't matter. It's like, yeah, the shoes don't matter yes. and they do matter. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, if the shoes don't matter, nothing matters mm -hmm. in a sense, because <laughs> the shoes are as much a part of your life as anything else is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the more that you make your shoes matter, the more that your work matters and your partner matters. And yes. that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's funny. This is making me think about like, um, kind of like Taoism and Confucianism as different approaches to spontaneity ultimately in a new way mm. whereas that like the the confucian way is like we will give you like enormous tomes of books to read and rituals and like know exactly how deep to bow and like just much kind of constraint mm. and by doing that over and over again by being very formal you will be able to access spontaneity mm. whereas Taoism has a much more direct kind of like don't do that <laughs> that's over the top and over engineered our way is more direct to kind of access it directly mm -hmm. it feels like the state that you get to behind that of fully alive intention presence like once you've got that thing anything that you do is right and fine mm -hmm. and i i think i have a slight issue and 
it's maybe with Zen, but a certain expectation that one that this thing that you have has to be gentle. This mm -hmm. thing that you have has to be contained and mm -hmm. in some way like I don't know slightly formal. Mm -hmm. I think a little bit of that. Whereas mm -hmm. surely, like as you were saying, like if you can bring the same energy, the same presence and intention to seeming careless, mm -hmm. <laughs> what does it matter? Why why do you need to be contained and quiet and mm -hmm. whatever? It seems to me whenever I hear Zen stories of masters, they're always like they're hitting people with sticks and they're like mm. <laughs> doing extremely crazy things. Mm. But we we kind of see these things as being like calm and gentle and all these words, which I don't think is necessarily the, that needs to be that way. If oh, so they're hitting the sticks. Crazily, hitting people with sticks is an exemplifying the thing because it's like uh, spontaneous and unexpected, but like yeah. being calm and contained isn't the thing. Well, there's or being required to. Yeah, it seems like the Zen master stories always involves them kind of doing outrageous things, mm -hmm, ultimately, mm -hmm. like kind of mm -hmm. like, I mean, in Zen stories, like, yeah, he cut off his own arm or something. Uh -huh. like, it's, it's really ridiculous over the top, yeah. clearly. But um, once they get there, mm -hmm. clearly, whatever they do is good. Whatever mm -hmm. they do is part of the thing they're talking about because it's spontaneous and it's fully alive and whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about why so much of the training seems to go through stillness. Mm. Um, and I worry that there's a kind of um, reification almost of the stillness part, as opposed to the underlying, like, whatever it is that they get when they're fully spontaneous and connected to that thing, ultimately. I there's see. a modern Bailey type thing going on uh -huh. here, I think, uh -huh. um, ultimately. Mm. I just something on my mind, but yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. I think it should be fine to be able to throw your shoes across the room if it's <laughs> fully <laughs> present, intentional, and uh -huh. spontaneous, ultimately. Right, right. Interesting. Huh. It's the stillness in particular that you're criticizing, or is it more broad than that? I wouldn't want to use the word criticizing even. Uh -huh. um, it's... What am I trying to say? It seems like there's an image of an ideal, ultimately, of someone who you know walks very upright and moves through the world without like disrupting anything mm. and is in some way above it i mm. don't know in some way like not part of it whereas there's another way of seeing it might be more even kind of tantric view of like kind of fully like energized and whatever mm -hmm. you do as a human is is fine because the world is you're part of the world and the world's expressing itself like kind of expressing those more, like, like kind of stronger energies mm. um maybe even disruptive or um kind of i don't know like creating creation and destruction at the same time almost rather than just creation almost mm. so like both sides of that energetic coin um and it should be okay to be able to express those energies in a way that is still done by a zen master in a way that is still done by um someone who's got the thing that mm. these people are aiming at ultimately like mm. But again, with the shoe example, like if I look like I'm being careless with my shoes, it might look like that. But, you know, what if I'm still bringing exact same energy to it as mm. I would if I put them down gently and conscientiously? Mm. Like I think there's, there's a conscientious thing I'm actually pointing out. Why, why is conscientiousness the, or things that look like conscientiousness the ideal? It mm. feels like it's more to do with like monks living together in a monastery. They've got to get along. So, mm. of course, please be tidy and like don't make too much noise <laughs> is is coming out as well as like kind of almost more than or as part of the the state you're trying to let, get to which is spontaneous and present and intentional mm -hmm. i'm not sure how much I'm, i haven't rehearsed any of this at all i've oh. spoken about this stuff before so i'm just kind of riffing yeah. and see what comes out so yeah if it's making yeah. no sense that's fine I'm no, it, it, makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense it makes sense no um i just i felt like there's more i didn't quite get and i, I feel like i'm getting it more now so um cool at least in my own experience of this sort of thing, it seems like one of the qualities that's being yeah, it seems it seems like the ultimate thing is is sort of about the spontaneity that you're pointing to, but mm. a prerequisite for that seems to be mindfulness and presence, mm. which is included in conscientiousness, but um, not the same as. And uh, mm. there's something about just 
are you actually present as you do the thing? And and like mm. putting your shoes away in a certain way is a test. Like, did was I present when I did the thing or or not? Yeah. And yeah. um, it's not. It's just a structure for checking that. You know. Yeah. And yeah. and you know, I interestingly, right. I think the the spontaneity thing, like, so much of you know. I trained at like a non-Zen place that was inspired by Zen, but it wasn't Zen, but it was mm. sort of inspired by Zen. And this is a contention sure. for that tradition, but uh, not Zen, inspired by Zen. And uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that would, I mean, it would just drive me crazy at the time, but the rules were always changing. It was like, oh, oh wow. You know, like the way you do the incense for the chanting is changing or the way that the drum should be beat or, you know, this. And it's like, well, actually that forces you to mm. both be present is like oh did i do it and also like to be adaptable and not attached to a specific thing which is actually mm. like a generator for spontaneity if you're not attached to it being a specific concept then you can be spontaneous so in a mm. weird way the like rigor is and yeah. requirements for structure creates the conditions for spontaneity i like that because it points at like unfixation uh, mm -hmm. unfixatedness as a way of being which i think points at I think it points at the thing I've been playing with, well, I'm putting it aliveness. My teacher, my AT teacher calls it aliveness as well. Mm -hmm. um, so a bit of a tangent, but it's, it's related. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot on Twitter about awareness. So expanded awareness and collapsed awareness, basically. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing that more and more as like one side of a two by two matrix mm -hmm. almost, mm -hmm. where you have awareness and you have aliveness. Um, and aliveness is a thing I want to talk about more and more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the unfixatedness or maybe even, it's not quite mindfulness, but the, the amount of, of you that you're bringing to um, anything, to all of life, the, the, the how turned up the world is ultimately, mm -hmm. is this aliveness point. And I think that aliveness goes away whenever you get fixated to some extent. Awareness can collapse when you're fixated, but it's, it's also aliveness can go away when you're fixated. Mm. So let's say that um, you're doing a ritual, you're doing the, the, the incense, for the for the the whatever um and it's the same as it's been for the last year it's just exactly the same and you're kind of an autopilot mm -hmm. you're very present right you're really in like you're very much there but you're also kind of on a routine like you're not quite you know as as engaged in the world as you could be mm -hmm. um so i would call that like expanded awareness with collapsed aliveness almost or reduced aliveness mm. whereas there's a mental move that you can make or a move that you can make where you you seem to get closer to the substance of the world where mm. the world seems closer to you in some sense and everything gets more vivid. You're more there. And it's, it's not quite mindfulness in the same, it's not quite present, but it, it, it is present. It's, it's how close are you to the surface of the world mm. rather than on autopilot while your body moves through it and you're kind of off somewhere else almost. Mm. It's, you are here right now. Mm. Um, yeah, I need to work on this some more, but there's, there's something there's something here that is incredibly hard to put into words. But once you've experienced it, it um, mm. becomes very, very clear. I, when I first experienced it, I was like, it was like I've been living my, my life as if through a veil before, mm. a kind of foggy, far away, dimmer in some sense. And then when I was shown this aliveness, thing, I was like, wow, everything is very real. <laughs> it's like everything's more three-dimensional, things are brighter, that kind of thing. And mm. I feel like this is a, an axis along which you can move. Mm. And I'm very curious to figure out, okay, what are, what's the language around it? What are the, the tricks and the ways in? What are everyday examples that people can relate to? That kind of thing. But right now it's, it's more than just awareness that I wanna be playing in. Mm. I wanna get people maximally aware and maximally alive, mm -hmm. if you like. That's my, mm. that's my aim, I think, at this point, for now mm. at least. What was it like when you were, you say you're like shown this aliveness thing? Mm. What was, what was, was there like a specific memory associated with that? And what happened? There was one particular memory, I think after my second or third AT lesson, where I, I, I worked in an office around the corner from the training center. Mm. And I was walking home, I'm walking home, <laughs> walking back to the office. And I was looking at the street and it just suddenly looked three dimensional in a way that it never had before. Mm. Um, I, I cannot describe, like, it, I, I, almost like before when I was looking at the view out my eyes, it was as if I'd been seeing the world as a painting or as a projection, as a two-dimensional thing that I had kind of infers depth from. Mm. 
you know how you look at paintings like oh there's clearly depth here but it's also a flat surface mm -hmm. it was like that's how the entire world had been up until that moment mm. until suddenly the world became actually 3d it's like wow. holy crap it's actually a depth <laughs> here it's, i can actually go reach into it as opposed to kind of walking into a painting what, that recedes mm. if that makes sense mm. does that make any sense at all i don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever experienced anything like this or not but it was a weird perceptual distortion that's like more vivid more real more like i can actually engage with it and kind of move around within it rather than yeah look at it huh. and how are you um yeah, I mean, you, you said something this effect again earlier, but like, yeah, just how would you describe what this aliveness axis is? I'm going to lean on McGilchrist here. Mm. Um, so again, the, the, the brain hemisphere model um, from Master's Emissary. He frames the reason, ultimate reason for hemispheric separation as to solve the, the issue that all animals face, which is how to eat without being eaten. Hmm. so if you so our attention has a very narrow field right it's like three degrees or something off center anything outside of that is inferred um the only thing we can see is in a very narrow beam if you were an animal hunting prey with only that narrow beam of attention you would be vulnerable to attack right hmm. so you need this wide open monitoring thing as well so that while you're hunting the, the whatever the the rabbit you're also able to hear the eagle or the mm -hmm. lion or whatever it is that's hunting you. So aliveness, I think, is the maximally coherent combination of those two things fully switched on at once. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think I'm seeing is that expanded awareness can look like this, which is really passive. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, I'm listening to the world, but there's no intention, there's no movement in the world, there's no like hunting almost the looking for the thing that you're going to eat so aliveness comes from the the combination of yes i'm in the world and i'm going after that thing mm. <laughs> if you like mm -hmm. and the intention the movement the organization principle towards something mm. i think gives that sense of aliveness beyond mere passive observance of what is if you like mm. Mm. it's that i'm exerting my agency i'm navigating i'm responding i'm participating mm. if you like i think that's what's easily lost in in mindfulness practice is participation mm -hmm. rather than just noting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting because the way chula dasa dis defines mindfulness is the balance of attention and awareness mm -hmm. I, I forget the exact yeah. words he used but that's how he talks about it. and it's like yeah. it sounds like what you're talking about is about attention but attention used for the sake of intention and purpose mm -hmm. and like directedness yes so i'm gonna parrot my teacher here and the, it's annoying because the the sentence doesn't make sense much outside at world but i'll, I'll say it and then we can go from there so there's a, a term in at called the primary control mm -hmm. which is hard to define but it's it's something that you can switch on by adjusting the relationship between the head and the skull and the head and the spine, basically. So you make a small adjustment. There's, there's been discussions about reflex systems and it's not out of date, but there's some bio, biophysical mechanism by which it affects functioning, if you like. Mm. And the thing that you learn to switch on in AT is the primary control. Now, Alexander called, called it the, the head neck back relationship, ultimately. Mm. My teacher, so Peter Nobes, he, he calls it the attention intention head neck back relationship so oh. once you have attention you have intention your system organizes you have this, uh, this whatever this thing is and then your your functioning improves hmm. but it's coordinated more by attention and intention than it is by well in the traditional at it's done by direction so you you say to yourself allow my head neck to be free so the head can go forwards and up and other stuff goes on hmm. um I don't necessarily agree with that stuff. We never learned it that way. Uh, it feels more like um, a finger in the moon conflation, if you like. So you're talking about the finger rather than the thing that's pointing to. Um, but there's something around. Uh, so attending to something, attending to the lens, I'm attending, and now I'm intending to relate to it in a certain kind of way. It switches on a kind of a flow, uh, a liveness, an engagement that is beyond merely noting. So there's something very powerful about that. 
intention, attention in a field of awareness. And those two things are dynamic and come together in ways that are underexplored and under talked about, I think, that I'd like to dig into some more. Hmm. And it's super interesting to you now because my other talking points are much more articulate. Hmm. <laughs> and this one feels really graspy and kind of on the edge and ethereal and weird. Hmm. It will clarify itself over the next year, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but for now, this is like, oh, it's kind of messy and mm -hmm. I can feel the frustration, but it's also important that I go here now because it needs to, I need to inhabit the unfamiliarity and then mm -hmm. it'll clarify with time. Mm -hmm. Definitely. How are you planning to present this sort of pedagogically in your course? So I did a workshop uh, uh, two months ago. Um, where for the first time, I don't know why I did this, I split the workshop into awareness and aliveness, mm. um, which was the first time I did that, and it worked. Mm. So right now, my course is entirely awareness, basically, there's a little bit on primary control, mm -hmm. which I want to now reframe as aliveness, I think. So I'll have two sections, two big mm. sections, awareness and aliveness, and then there'll be a combination of it, and basically come up with the various, various like games, um, ideas, times in life when you've experienced this, and kind of train aliveness separately mm. because it, it isn't it's not the same as concentration in terms of awareness and attention control mm -hmm. it's not just keep your attention on something it's very much the intention element of see the world as a thing you can participate in and change and be in dynamically <laughs> it's mm. rather than keep your eye on something or keep your attention on something for a long time one one thing that my uh, a friend fellow AT teacher from my my training school does is she will say hey just imagine that there's a like a ladybird ladybug um, on the wall and just like track it just like track it slowly across the wall and if it goes across like a, a lamp or whatever just like assume it's like on whatever surface you're looking at but keep your eyes lively keep your eyes moving a little bit and then just see what that does for you because there's something about keeping your eyes alive that keeps your entire system a little bit dynamic. Mm. Whereas as soon as your eyes fixate, it kind of, there's some kind of holding, tightening process. Mm. And, and one of the ways that I can see people when they get stuck in AT lessons is like they're, they're, they're just staring a little bit. They're kind of their eyes slightly glaze over and looking at something and like, hey, Go and look at something. Mm. Um, it's like, oh, yeah. And it's not just that they come back to presence, but their entire body, their entire system gains a kind of energizedness mm. that was missing before. Mm. And I'm just wondering what is what is the quality of the the hunting, the tracking thing that mm. is in what what are the things in it? Is it's not just attention. It is attention. It's not just intention. I think there's something else going on there that is switching on a coordination mechanism, a coordinating principle in our, mm. in our body minds, I think. Mm. It's like some kind of movement towards some kind of freedom. Okay, my teachers use the language freedom from and freedom to. Mm. So check that you have freedom to do anything. Check that you have freedom to go anywhere. Mm. There's a kind of, at all moments, could I walk over there? Could I? Could I? Mm. And that could I thing, if you stay in could I, activates this aliveness to mm. some extent mm. as if you find yourself like passively receiving like could i stand up actually no i couldn't stand up that, that was not possible for me mm. now i could now i could okay the more that i could mm -hmm. the more this thing becomes available the more this thing turns on you become like a there's this word i can't find <laughs> but yeah there's there's this this principle engages itself mm. are there any other ways that i like i might practice this or someone listening might practice this Good question. <laughs> I would, it's quite abstract as I say it. So I'm gonna say the things like, and it's not gonna resonate I think for now, but while going about your day, it's just like, it's, it's a step beyond check that you can notice. Like check that you can notice is the awareness side of things, right? It's, could I notice my name being called? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's expanded awareness. Could I then go and say something to that person? Could I go and 
and engage with them is mm. the aliveness part. So it's check that you could go anywhere, check that you could do anything, check that mm. you could make any choice available to you. But really embody that. It's not mm. intellectual. It's could I at this moment, could I stand up? Mm. I could. I couldn't at 10 seconds ago because I wasn't thinking about that in that way. But mm. now I'm like, yes, my body is there is sufficient like muscle tension and preparedness and availability that if I wanted to stand up, I could stand up. Mm. And have that thing switched on more of the time. Mm. So get familiar with what that thing is. Like what is what is it that changes in my body when I kind of check in? Could I stand up? I'm not going to, but could mm. I? Mm. And then like see what that's like in more of life mm. almost. Right. There's a sense in which, like, even though I'm sitting, I'm still moving. It's mm -hmm. like I could go from standing, sitting. I'm sitting, but am I still like in the process of standing up again? Mm. Even though my muscles are switched off, but I'm mm. still kind of dynamically engaged in this movement almost. As if you're doing Tai Chi, then you come and sit down, but you're still doing Tai Chi right now. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> that, Interesting. That quality of thing. Huh. Yeah, there's some connection there. I, I was thinking about Tai Chi just before you mentioned it as well. Yeah. I, I've just been training it in a bunch. And like, there's some principle that I've learned in my body from practicing Tai Chi mm. that it's something about like the way that they describe you're supposed to practice is like, it's like a wave where there's expansion and contraction and mm. it's never static. You're, yeah. uh, you know, striking, defending, mm. expanding, contracting. And like, just at the peak of something, it's not like, oh, you hold, you like yeah, are you, still, yeah. Um, so you shouldn't stop until the very end in some way, even if it looks like you, it might look like you're actually pausing, but it shouldn't be mm. that you're pausing. And um, uh, somehow that feels related. I don't know why, but my body is like, oh, this is related. <laughs> yeah, no, it feels related. Mm -hmm. It's almost like what I'm saying is you, you said, don't stop until the end, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is don't stop. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you for teaching me Tai Chi today, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Because you know you finish you finish the the forty step sequence or whatever it is, and then like okay, yeah, I'm still doing tai chi, just I'm doing right. the dishes at the same time, right, right, just right. bring that thing into the dishes, right, right. Like, could I do tai chi now? Uh -huh. Oh no, I couldn't. What have uh -huh. I diminished? What have I diminished right now by not being able to do tai chi right now while Oof. doing the dishes? This is so going to revolutionize my tai chi practice <laughs> for sure. I know, I know that that's this. Yeah, this feels like a question that will take like. 30 or 40 years to, I mean, I don't know how long, I don't want to preclude myself from it happening sooner, <laughs> but like, it feels like, yeah, like a question that I can continually investigate through mm. Tai Chi for sure. Well, um, like right now, for example, like, in what ways does it feel like you're not doing Tai Chi right now? Mm. So, I don't have to answer that, but just be aware of the way in that you're not doing Tai Chi, right? Mm. Can you now, without changing anything about your posture, do a little more Tai Chi? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. What have you changed? That's not it. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, thing yeah, that, yeah. the thing that you're going looking for is not the thing that you were just doing. Yeah. So without going off looking too much, do more Tai Chi without moving too much. Yeah. What are you what are you bringing in? It's 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 uh yeah, this uh -huh. is the answer. Yeah, yes, that is the cool, awesome. <laughs> For the listeners, I just waved my hand. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to watch it, but yeah. But that's what I'm trying to point out, I think, mm -hmm. is whatever you're kind of playing with there of like more Tai Chi without doing Tai Chi, I mm -hmm. think is anal analogous to more aliveness mm -hmm. that I'm trying to generalize, essentially. Mm -hmm. But it's it's incredibly hard to... This is way more difficult than awareness, I found. I, I Just in general, I love talking to you about this stuff and... I know I recently read the piece that you wrote as well. It's just like mm. the, when I hear you talk about this, it's like downloads happen for me of like, oh, <laughs> I could do this. And this reminds me, I, maybe you've made this connection consciously or not, but just to reflect to you, like another thing that happened for me, I can't remember if this was in our last podcast conversation or one of our informal conversations, but you pointed out that um, when you speak, you're aware of options that you could mm. say and it seems mm. like that's a way to practice it as well as like yeah. knowing that there are multiple options that you could go towards in a conversation or something mm. that you say or and then and then you still have to choose something but yeah. like knowing that there's optionality there yeah I, I so I do experience that as I as I talk now it's quite spatial so mm -hmm. very spatial it's 
yeah, it's like I'm talking to you and I could say this, 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 or this, you mm-hmm. know, like it's kind of like that. And then I'm going to go this one, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. all of these are here. So I think another way of conceptualizing awareness and aliveness is like awareness is, yes, I'm aware of these four things I could mm-hmm. say. Aliveness is, and I could say any of them. Mm-hmm. And in the space of being able to say any of them, I'm going to say this one, right? Whereas awareness is like, I can only really go this way, can't I? And, and somehow <laughs> when I experience you know? that, like, this is going to be a little too limited, but it's almost like it's different to choose that option from knowing that there are others than if you just mm. did that thing in the first place. Like the, yeah. the way it comes out or gets expressed is different or maybe even includes elements yeah. of the others or, or specifically excludes them or something in a way that's much more conscious, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. That That is Alexander technique as well. So mm. when you are when you are available to all the ways of doing something, you get unfixated and you can do things unhabitually, essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a couple of layers to that. So there's no awareness, which is I can own, I'm only aware of the one thing I can say, which is my default habitual way of being, I can say the thing. Mm. There's the awareness. Oh, I'm aware of things I could say, but I don't feel like I have permission to, I don't feel like I, I actually could say that. Mm. And that's like a high awareness, low, low, low agency, low aliveness thing. But the thing where yeah, I'm aware of all the things and I know I'm very confident, very safe in the fact that I could say any of these things. And I'm even in choosing something, I'm not closing those down. Mm. I'm, I'm, it's like I'm inhabiting all of them at once. Mm. And that unlocks something that it's like a global unfixation almost. Mm. Mm. Um, and from global unfixation, I'm going to pick one. Mm. But I could easily pick other ones. Mm-hmm. That's, the, that, that's the kind of aliveness thing. And even when I when I start thinking about it, I find myself kind of moving more, I kind of sway and like I'm, mm. my joints become a little bit like unhooked, like kind of unfixated a bit. Is that is that is that a crucial element of this aliveness that you would find yourself moving more fluidly? Uh, it's very common to happen. Mm-hmm. One one uh, a little trap that uh, the trainees in AT get caught up in is you would end up kind of swaying a little bit mm-hmm. and like once you've got this thing switched on, yeah, there's, there tends to be a kind of natural um, swaying movement, but you can easily get caught up in like, oh yeah, I can do AT now. I just have to sway around. Mm. If I just keep swaying, I'm doing a uh-huh. yeah, like, yeah. That's not don't, it. Don't, <laughs> right? don't just sway to do it. Don't yeah, just that's sway. What's so, right? that's what's so, um, I experienced a lot of frustration when I demonstrated my hand moving because mm. I was like, the answer isn't my hand moving. No, of course. It's yeah. like <laughs> the state of mind that came from my hand moving, you know? Yes. Uh, so like, it's not just like, oh, you know, it's, um, exactly. anyway, uh, yeah, it was it, frustrating. Again, again, I, I hear you again. It's, it's the <laughs> finger that points to the moon is not the moon. Yes. And this is why I'm so careful. I think not even consciously about not giving simple one statement answers to what is Alexander mm-hmm. technique, mm-hmm. because people will read that and as like, oh, it's this one thing. Yes. If I just do this one thing, I'm doing AT. And people will mm-hmm. say, oh, I'm doing that already. Like, Everything he's describing, I'm just doing already. I'm a natural. I'm already doing it. No, you're not. Uh-huh, uh-huh, like you, uh-huh. you've somehow simplified, misread, or like assumptioned your way through what I've said, and there's huh. something way deeper behind it. Like whatever it was that you were doing with your like this. Yeah. I can guess at what that thing was because I have experience in my domain. Huh. But it's not just. Oh yeah, Alexander technique or Tai Chi is just moving your hand from here to here. Uh, yeah, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, it's not. No, no. it's not. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's the it's the necessary preconditions. It's the it's the base of awareness and whatever it might be that allows you to huh. to move in that way. What yeah. what were what were you seeing? Like, what would you reflect that you could guess at that you were saying? Uh, from you. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. I. It's hard to articulate mm-hmm. uh, again because uh, uh, yeah, just just a meta a, note. I want to. I want to. Yeah. Like, it feels like a joy that I can have in this podcast <laughs> is giving you the opportunity to articulate the things you have not yet articulated. No, it's so, it's incredibly useful actually. Uh-huh. Yeah, because I I don't get held in this space for long enough to struggle sometimes. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So it's good. And I think what I was seeing in you was a familiar. I don't want to say facial expression, but um, presence, ultimately. Mm-hmm. You weren't a robotic, like moving your hand. There was a kind of a fully embodied process mm-hmm. behind it. 
and one thing that I've trained to do is pick up on the process rather than the the object level, if you like, of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's the bigger picture, reasoning through and awareness and presence and being with almost that mm -hmm. that you are that you're pointing at. And mm -hmm. at the same time, your language behind it's like, yes, I get it. It's I haven't got words for it, but it's I'm like, yeah. yes, exactly. The fact that you're saying you haven't got words for it and you're you're showing me in movement is like, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So yeah, Amazing. it was awesome. I think there's a lot of stuff that I've just said that I didn't know that I knew mm -hmm. that I think will make its way into some, Excellent. some kind of material somewhere. Yeah, I noticed uh, for the sake of that, I noticed it's interesting at a certain point you use the word agency. And mm -hmm. I feel like I'd be curious to know it sounds like your teacher uses the word aliveness and maybe you mm. want to use that word aliveness, but something came alive for me, alive for me yeah. in hearing you use the word agency <laughs> instead. Yeah. And that might be an interesting thing to investigate. Yeah. I, I like the word agency. Um, yeah. It's just more normal language. That's uh -huh. what I think it's something people can relate to and mm -hmm. people want. Whereas aliveness is, it's a word, it's a real mm -hmm. word. It's not fake, but it's not one we really use. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, it sounds fake <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. Um I almost wonder, and, like, if you get to the point where, unfortunately, for the sake of, say, a course, you have to be like, what is aliveness? Aliveness yeah, calling exactly. is like an increased sense of agency as your awareness yes, is expanded yeah. or something like that. Something like that. Agency is, it's the ability to make choices, right? The ability to take action. And there's some, so agency is good, but it seems not quite complete. Because agency adding spontaneity does, to it? Yeah, I think. Ah, it's it's close to that. It's uh -huh. more like it's more like spontaneity is the state that's going on underneath mm. all the time, and then aliveness is the channeling of it. Mm. It's like the the intentional coordination of spontaneity, mm -hmm. almost. <laughs> right. So yes, I could pick all of these options to say, I am going to pick that one. But it's almost like I don't know that or I haven't chosen that to the very last moment. Mm. I'm, I'm available and open and spontaneous and that way. Mm. And then I do this way in a, in a spontaneous way almost. Mm. Um, but one of the things that we play with is, is not knowing. So like, for example, classic training thing is there's a ball on the table. Go and, go and pick up the ball, but don't decide if you're going to pick it up until it actually happens. Mm. Right. So mm. you're just walking towards it and you, you will find out whether you'll pick it up or not, when you pick it up mm. or not, right? Mm. And the way in which you move when you do that is very different from how you move. It's like, I'm going to pick up the ball mm. or I'm going to walk past the ball. It's totally different because mm. you don't know until the last second. So you are available to whatever happens and then it just does itself. Mm. Some part of you chose, or you might have a flash of in, you know, intention at some moment, but your psychophysical system organizes itself differently. Mm because the spontaneous spontaneity is cultivated and allowed and then directed. Hmm. Hmm. I feel like this points to the thing I was sensing about the connection to Tai Chi, because it's like, hmm. um, you don't want to stop the motion, right? You want to expand and contract without a, a single point that is a stopping point. And it seems like you're saying like, oh, until the last moment, but it seems like another way to articulate the very same thing, if I'm understanding correctly, is hmm. like, you do not stop being spontaneous simply because yes. you have taken an action that is from spontaneity. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So in a sense, when you're when you're doing Tai Chi, and, and I think the way that they're pointing you to do it, it's not like, a, it's not a, a set of movements. Mm -hmm. It's a cultivation of spontaneity. Mm -hmm. Only, yeah, you're being spontaneous the entire time in a mm -hmm. directed way. Mm -hmm. It's the, mm -hmm. that's why AT and I think everything else like this is not a what. Mm -hmm. Like Tai Chi is not, I, I haven't done it much myself, but mm -hmm. it's not the what of the moves you're making. It's the how you do it. Mm -hmm. Alexander Technique, I think like Tai Chi and other things like it, it's not a what, mm -hmm. it's a how. It's mm -hmm. a how you do things rather than a what you do. So mm -hmm. it might look like a what. It's like, oh, I'm standing a particular way or I'm moving in my arms a particular way, but it's not about the thing you can see. Mm -hmm. It's about the way in which, and I think the way in which that you're cultivating is spontaneity mm -hmm. that is just contained and directed. And mm -hmm. yeah. That's do they ever... Do they ever talk about virtue or like correct action in the world in AT stuff? Uh, the closest thing I can think of right now is what would be called use, use of mm. the self, mm. um, which 
could generalize into an out there perspective if I wanted to get a bit theoretical with it, but it means how you use yourself. <laughs> and there's almost a karmic um, element to it as well. So if I have poor use, it means I'm not, it's almost like the shoe example from before. Like if you, how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I throw my shoes across the thing, it shows mm -hmm. that I'm not being careful and not being present or intentional. Mm -hmm. The same applies to our body. It's like if I have poor use, then I'm like slouching there and like everything's uncoordinated and bad. That's something that adds up mm -hmm. um, over time to accumulated like damage, tension, poor use, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So ideally what you want is to be living with good use all the time. Mm. Um, Alexander called this the name of his fourth book, The Universal Constant in Living. Mm. And it's universal because it's this, you know, the more you practice with good use, the more you have the benefits and the kind of the unwinding mm. on un untangling of the things you've been doing to yourself over the over your years. Mm. And that, that feels like a virtue of mm -hmm. like a thing that you're constantly choosing to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to be with good use, which from my view means unfixated ultimately, is having mm -hmm. this aliveness yes. thing switched on. Um, and I can totally see that generalizing out to societal scale stuff at some point. Mm. Um, but that would need some careful language as to what that would mean from a societal perspective. Whereas at least with, in Buddhism, with virtue, it's like, you know, you can talk about um, right something as applied to other people and the world around you. Whereas I can imagine that good use could, when you have good use, your functioning is better. So that I think your interactions are better as well. So you can see a kind of, there's a, there's a virtue there and the more coordinated you are, the better you'll function in society. That's mm -hmm. one angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I ask because um, I'm reminded of a few things and like one of them is that just when, the more I touch into this spontaneity myself from various things, like there seems to be a quality of like, I would describe as like appropriateness or fitting mm. Where like, for example, the thing that you say from having expanded awareness of multiple options that you could mm. say fits better than if you just jump to what you're going to say already mm. yeah. um, or something like that. And I think like, yeah, I'm almost reminded that there seems to be some utility to like, yeah, like ethical constraints, I think work similarly to what we were talking about earlier of like, if you have various rules of like do this don't do this in this circumstance mm. like that helps you entrain this thing but when it's fully bearing fruit in your life it is the spontaneity and it's not coming from a rule it's like being totally present to what's there mm. and responding accordingly yes exactly so the kind of self-trust element there of if i have good say function mm -hmm. which you could ex to extrapolate to mean ethical function mm -hmm. and you know whatever else social function then whatever you do spontaneously is the right thing. Mm -hmm. So you always want to train the thing beneath that. And it's like, if I can have good function, I can trust myself to act in the world spontaneously. Mm -hmm. If I don't have good function, I have to constrain and force and all that kind of thing because I can't trust myself to act appropriately if I let go of the control mm -hmm. of trying to be trying to be not spontaneous ultimately. Um, mm. Yeah. I had another point there, but I lost it. Um, It'll come back maybe, but yeah, I, I think I, I agree um, with the with the general point there. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's gone. It'll come back, <laughs> I'm sure. Hmm. Out, out of curiosity, have you seen the film, the Ip Man films? Ip Man? No. Okay, there's some there's some martial arts films, but uh, I quite like them. They're about Wing Chun rather than Tai Chi, but okay. um, I feel like one of the themes of these films is that he's demonstrating the spontaneity and like mm. for him and that, that that's virtue and like that that's more important than like he's excellent at the Wing Chun but like yeah. he is ethically admirable in each situation that he faces in a way mm. that is spontaneous it's like somehow he responds appropriately to even very complex unprecedented situations mm. and it's like yes that was the thing that needed to be done there like how, how did yes. he know he was present exactly and yeah. actually that reminds me of what I was going to say um is mm. that my, my teacher has a riff on this as well. Um, mm. I think he had a story where like teacher asks, like, what would you do if your child X? Mm. Like, well, how would you respond to your child behaving in this kind of way? And he would just say appropriately. <laughs> I would deal mm. with it appropriately. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, like you can easily dismiss that as, you know, naive or as a cop out. Mm. But at the same time, it's also 
the most true response if you want to get the the best response because mm-hmm. if you're if you're presupposing oh if x then y well what if not x or what if x isn't quite the x that you meant mm. what if y is not the right way to go but that's just what you're thinking now mm-hmm. like there's a there's a case of the state in which that whatever happens is the right thing to happen assuming that mm. you are responding in a way that is present and you know you've done the work already so to speak mm. um as you're saying with this with this wing chun example mm. um if you've thought about the ethics then what you what you'll do is more aligned to that mm-hmm. um so I, I i guess i can see the case that, that confucian look will put you through 10 years of hard rigor of mm-hmm. like learn all the ways of being that you should be and then when the time comes you'll have it like automatically entrained in you mm-hmm. that's one way the other way i think is the more direct method of improve your general functioning mm. such that when you get to that point it kind of assumes that people are naturally good ultimately that mm-hmm. we are naturally fit for mm-hmm. these these interactions this society and this way of being mm-hmm. um and then whatever happens and as part of our natural fitness is is right ultimately mm-hmm. um rather than overthinking these things mm-hmm. um yeah or, tra- or, or requiring our our cognitions to make the choice in the moment when our cognitions might not be fast enough or mm-hmm. even right <laughs> at the time say you add like an aliveness section to your course uh yeah. is there a way that you might help someone practice this use quality so this is kind of getting into where more traditional teaching happens which mm-hmm. is body coordination movement and that kind of thing and i would like to get into that and that would need to be in person and couldn't be online it is done on people. I think the pandemic really helped actually for mm. the profession to realize that teaching can be done online mm. um, because so many had to do it online. Like, mm-hmm. oh, it's working. <laughs> people are having benefits. They can practice this stuff. So I think I would like to get to a point where I can teach the on the uh, the body stuff online mm-hmm. and do the whole like yeah movement posture all that stuff. And but I want to do that with a firm foundation of having really gone through what it would look like without that stuff. Mm. first of all i don't think i can teach i guess that's a point i was thinking about recently which is when a a teacher is teaching someone one-on-one they get the feedback of that person right so you have a specific tangle you have a specific like holding pattern or whatever it is that you do and we can work with you specifically on that because i can get feedback on you as we go through the lessons Mm. obviously i can't do that on a broadcasty medium Mm -hmm. particularly one that isn't even like one-on-one zoom type stuff i can't even see them Mm. so what i'm teaching is much more like general principles and i have to trust people to apply that to themselves Mm -hmm. and i don't get any feedback Mm -hmm. so what i might start doing is like look move in these ways get a mirror record yourself and start paying attention to what's going on Mm. and see if you can and i might show general patterns for example or examples like work with certain people and record that maybe like here's 10 people I worked with. Mm-hmm. Can you see some interesting commonalities and like, patterns and things? Mm-hmm. Um, and just look out for ways in which you are misusing yourself. Mm-hmm. And can you can you learn to inhibit is the word those mm-hmm. those patterns in that moment and allow something else to happen. Mm-hmm. And so many people have reported, oh yeah, I just I walk better now. Um, and I don't teach any kind of movement stuff at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're finding, oh yeah, I'm just moving more freely, I'm taller, I'm like my back pain is gone. Um, mm-hmm. which reassures me that the general principles can just be applied to general functioning. And I want to get really good at teaching the, the general, like really firm foundation stuff. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. people will just naturally find their, their use, their functioning improving, and then they'll see it evidenced in, in certain parts of their life as mm-hmm. appropriate, <laughs> as appropriate again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's part of the reason. Well, I'm excited both for my own life, but also for this being at scale available mm-hmm. is like, I mean, you know, just from the inside perspective, when you do something from the spontaneity that is appropriate, mm. it's it's like the right thing and it feels so good and the world responds appropriately. It's like, it's delightful. And, um, you know, that's such a different vibe than, mm. um, you know, be ethical because this is the constraint. And like, I, right. I actually, that's been very useful for me. I think I would maybe err more on the Confucian side than you're saying myself, yeah, yeah. but like, it's surprising coming from that to be like, oh, this is 
morality, ethics, appropriate action in the world mm. is spontaneous and and delightful. And so, mm. and and it, it still has that quality of being a benefit in the world and helping people mm. rather than hurting them. And so to me, it would be exciting and, and a real gift to the world to include a component of that in the course, because if people just find themselves acting more ethically, or shall we say appropriately, like yeah. not only is that good for the world, but it's also just delightful. Yeah. Again, the yeah, service yeah, yeah. joy thing of like, it's the same thing, you know, like good action in the world is enjoyable. I want that for me and I want that for the world. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I would love that for the world too. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of interesting threads to fill on, I think. Um, and there's actually a, making a link back to your, your meta dance parties, mm -hmm. um, or the vibe camp on particularly. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there was like an increase of aliveness in the mm. room as well. Mm. Um, because again, it's one thing to matter on the cushion mm -hmm. and it's one thing to be like participating in something in the kind of, I am moving about in space. I'm organizing myself so as to move and like be dynamic with the world. And I think that's the kind of thing that turns up aliveness. Mm -hmm. So I, I could move in any direction and I'm going to move in that one because spontaneity mm -hmm. um, is very different from I must not move because I have a form, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, in fact, what I, I encourage meditators to do is <laughs> even when on the cushion, keep moving. Don't actually mm -hmm. move, mm -hmm. but keep the as if you could move or like mm -hmm. you're still doing Tai Chi, but perfectly still. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's helpful to move yeah. a little bit as you sit, like yeah. making adjustments and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And yeah, still the awareness that you could move, but also like, I mean, yeah. you're literally breathing the whole time. So you're yes. moving and like participating in that process and you don't, yeah. you're not still. Yeah, exactly. And so there's a difference, I think, between being still and then occasionally wiggling to like mm -hmm. adjust your back pain or something. Mm -hmm. And between that and always moving in a still way. Mm -hmm. Mm. those those that's the difference i'm pointing at mm. so yeah you're always breathing but again if you're kind of breathing is like still part of stillness mm. um and trying not to move and kind of being mm. stationary mm. <laughs> again different from like i am basically dancing here just mm -hmm. without moving <laughs> that's that's something else as you said that i got like the sense of like for so long i framed the way that i experienced meditation as like I have a lot of fidgety energy and it's uncomfortable mm. to sit. And that's part of why I don't sit very much these days and yeah. prefer dancing or standing or Tai Chi mm. <laughs> or lying down. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, I wonder if I got the sense of like, wonder if what's happening is that I'm constraining my body to a concept of stillness when it's actually still trying to be alive and move. Yeah. Even if I'm still like there I, we need better words here but better like, words exactly still, yeah. <laughs> you know like not moving that much but you're still alive yeah. and breathing and dancing. exactly exactly yeah. so i guess my challenge would be almost like all invitation is like what would it be like to fidget without moving <laughs> yes <laughs> fidget without moving <laughs> wow yeah uh, or be still and dance while you're or be still, still yeah exactly yeah. yeah so keep be always be dancing always be dancing while being while not moving so dance yeah. without moving yes I, I, it's perfect timing because I'm about to go on retreat and the part of my body and emotions that hates meditated seated meditation like oh not again not this again <laughs> yeah, and yeah. um you know uh yeah that's a really good invitation for that retreat mm. yeah nice yeah I need to remind myself more as well it, it's it's so easy to just drop this thing like mm -hmm. get in a chair this is why chairs for example that have too much support are bad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because like I, I give up responsibility. I'm now I'm giving yes. my aliveness up to the chair. Uh -huh. Whereas in in the AT world, the best kind of chair is like a flat, hard surface, mm -hmm. like not too hard that it hurts, but like you know, not padded mm -hmm. and whatever, such that you have to stay dynamic. Mm -hmm. Like there's no backrest, there's no armrest, there's just you sitting on the edge of a thing. That's mm -hmm. why you, most most AT teachers you'll see you can't see my chair, but they'll push their chair all the way back mm -hmm. if it's an office chair and sit right on the edge. Yes, um, where it's my like teacher the most, would do that um, too. Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. you're like, you have to be dynamic. Yes. You can't switch off your dynamicness. And dynamic oh. is another word for aliveness, is high dynamis dynamism. There's something that's happening for me right now that <laughs> is related to our previous conversation. I'm, I'd be curious to get your take on of like, uh -huh. my back is against the back of my chair. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, yes, that would be better. And there's something, there's some resistance to like, 
moving forward right now like I almost want to like wait until later in the conversation and then choose to move forward of my uh -huh. own accord but not just because you said it right now if that makes sense yes it's, there's like an emotional psychological thing there of like oh that would be better but if I do it right now I'm like betraying myself in some way yeah does that make I, any sense it does make sense and I almost encourage you to wait uh -huh. um yeah because if you're just like if you're like back against the chair like and I say, oh, it's bad. You're like, okay. Uh -huh, then yeah. the way in which the way in which you'll move will be habitual. Yes. Um, not from that spontaneous place. Yes. And this is actually you'll understand this now. Like the inhibition I'm talking about is your inhibit you're inhibiting not just the the wrong thing, but you're almost inhibiting the expression of spontaneity. Mm. So it's like a kind of not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Now I give permission mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. thing. And so there's choice back, there as opposed to just choice, being told yeah. to, or so there's, implicitly there's a, yeah. earlier it felt like being told to. Yeah. Exactly. So you have the idea that you could. Mm -hmm. There's there's the wrong way of doing it, which is the kind of, oh, I should just habitually respond. And there's also all the different spontaneous ways, the expression of spontaneity that could express themselves that you don't know which, what that would look like, mm -hmm. except that, to move forwards. Mm -hmm. So for you now, I'll be like, okay, you're going to move forwards and off the, off the back of the chair at some point, not yet, not yet. Mm -hmm. And at some point, release the not yet and see what happens mm -hmm. do it that way and mm -hmm. but, and that way of moving would be different than if i just way, lurched exactly. forward because i thought movement, i was supposed to yeah because you can't plan it uh -huh. you can't be like oh i'm going to move forward in a particular way it's more like at some point i'm going to move and i'll surprise myself as to how i do it yeah because i'm not involving myself in how i'm doing it right it'll just it'll do itself oh so. <laughs> I, I i that's so helpful like on a at level and then I'm also realizing like psychologically I think and emotionally it feels really important to have this sense of agency of like mm. yes I agree that this is better and I'm going to choose to do it for myself because I think it's better not because yes. someone else told me to exactly yeah like so, I'm an American this... at the end of the day <laughs> oh yeah totally freedom 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 yeah yeah <laughs> you moved forward <laughs> oh nice <laughs> out of interest what was that moving forward like Confident, proud, happy, definitely mm -hmm. a different like physical motion than I would have done otherwise. Right. Yeah. Cool. So I guess inhibition is a thing that you're kind of doing all the time mm -hmm. in a sense. So I'm doing all the right. In theory, when, when you're practicing this thing fully intentionally, it's all the time. And like I said, it's not just inhibiting habitual bad responses, but inhibiting all possible responses mm -hmm. such that you could do any one of them when mm -hmm. you let go of the inhibition. Mm -hmm. Um this is when like even what alexander did when he was like learning this stuff originally was like he would sit in a chair mm. and intend to stand up and then whenever he got ready or like started doing standing up he mm. would inhibit that he just wouldn't stand up mm. and he kept doing this for such a long time that eventually he just stood up mm. and he didn't do it he just stood mm. up mm. and that was because he was inhibiting all of his like habitual doing ways of doing it and so eventually it was like there was nothing left ultimately except for the spontaneous way, mm. which I think is exactly what, like that could sound like a Zen story mm. almost. It's mm -hmm. like you're cultivating spontaneity. Mm. And then at the end, the thing that is right is the thing that you can't control, mm. except in this case, you can't control the thing. You can control the how, mm. right? You can facilitate it, but you can't say what it will be mm. necessarily. Mm. I know I'm reminded that like maybe two months ago, we had a conversation on Slack where like mm -hmm. I told you, hey, I've been trying this inhibition thing and like it seems good, but it also feels like a punishment or something. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what you said, but it really helped. And I'm wondering if you can remind me of it now. Do you remember what you said? I, I can I look it up remember. too. We can look it up. <laughs> yeah, that. let me just look this up real quick because I, I feel like yeah. I have a question about that now. Um, it was a DM, there, right? It was a DM, yeah. Uh, uh, punishment. Yes. Okay. I've been trying to practice inhibition since like three calls ago and I've gotten yeah, better at it, but it often has an emotional mood of punishment. I can sense it maybe sometimes feeling fun or exciting, but mostly it feels like there's a piece of candy I don't get to eat. <laughs> and <laughs> you said inhibition is not about denying yourself things. It's not a t teacher parent voice saying, no, you can't have it's more about introducing a space or pause between the idea that you might and immediately doing it. You can 100% inhibit and then choose to do, have the thing you're going to do or have. The point is to pause first and then make it a conscious choice. You might decide after inhibiting that you in fact don't want the piece of candy, 
but it's a no indeed I do not want the candy rather than I am making myself not have the candy even though I actually want to have the candy yeah I feel like the way so one that was really helpful for me and two there's the way of talking about it as a pause or a choice is feels different to me than the way you're talking about it now of keep choosing not to do the thing until it happens by itself spontaneously. It's, it is the same thing. Uh -huh. And what I'm basically pointing at is living in the pause. Uh -huh. Right. So normally we live in like stimulus and response. I know that the, the, the perceptual control people, people are like uh, perceptual control theory. People would have a, uh, a bone to pick about stimulus and response, but let's use it for now anyway. Mm -hmm. Stimulus, you do the thing. There's no, there's no thought. There's no pause. It's just you do it. It's almost like it's predetermined in a sense. Mm. Whereas living in the pause is uncertain, unfamiliar. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. And in the state of not knowing, your system functions differently. Mm. And then when you let go of the pause in a specific direction, it continues to behave differently just in the in motion if you like in action in activity mm. so when i say so it's almost like the pause is spontaneity mm. in a sense mm. and then you're just pointing it at something mm. <laughs> ultimately when you release the inhibition in a, in a given direction and you don't stop the pause ever like you don't stop the spontaneity no it's, yeah. it's both you're both pausing i guess pauses i don't mean stop mm -hmm. <laughs> so stop means put the brakes on uh -huh. right pausing is just like it's that sense of not yet not yet not yet all the time hmm. as applied to everything obviously occasionally you will do like yes now but it's more like the the foundational layer if you like is of not yet what is the emotional mood of that for you like when you're just hearing that it's again feels like this punishment flavor like not no you can't have it yet and i imagine that the mood for you is quite different like what does that feel like emotionally for you it feels really spacious mm. and full of potential mm. because again, it's not saying never, mm -hmm. it's not saying, it's not saying, um, I guess you're kind of, I'm, I'm equating like a, like it, a child on a long car drive saying, can I play my game boy? And it's like, no, not yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, at some point I will give you permission to get the thing that you want. It's not the same as that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more like, when you start the Tai Chi sequence and you haven't quite started, what does that feel like in the, mo in the moment between standing there mm. and actually beginning to move? Mm. What is the, your quality of mind in those moments? Mm. Usually at the beginning, there's a still posture, you know, Wuji. It's a specific Wuji that looks a little bit different than ones you might have seen with the form mm. that I do. And I typically try, this is just me at my practice now, I typically yeah. try to al align my posture in a certain way and then drop that and become mm -hmm. as present as I can. Um, okay. And, you know, expand my awareness for one yeah. and, and just bring, yeah, bring presence into that. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, and then I start, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't know beyond that. Because it sounds to me like there's a, like that's a, a perfect time for inhibition, for not yetting, basically. Mm -hmm. And mm. it sounds like there's a kind of, yeah, like you said presence and okay, there's some checking going on of like, am mm -hmm. I standing the right way? Is the posture right? That kind of thing. But I, I can almost hear something else happening, mm. which is one of dropping into a certain state almost. And there's also, there's also an awareness that I am going to do the form. Yeah. Which is different than, no, you can't have it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when I'm saying pause, I don't mean you're not going to, or you can't have nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And the pause can be really short, mm -hmm. right? It's not like you're standing for 10 minutes going like, well, just kind of wait for this thing until whatever mm -hmm. happens. It's like, it's like, no, it's, it's when you do the thing it's conscious mm -hmm. and the pause is The pause is almost equivalent to like an unlock move, mm. Mm. like taking off the brakes. Mm -hmm. So for me, like saying, if I, someone yells stop, mm -hmm. it's not just that I stop moving. It's that I slam on the brakes. Mm 
Mm. I lock up. I'm like, okay, I'm stopped. I've, mm. I'm definitely immobile. Mm. Whereas pausing is a dynamic thing. Mm. It's a kind of like, again, like dancing without moving. It's mm. like, I'm, I'm available. I could do anything from this mm -hmm. position of pausing. I could go in any direction. I could make any movement. Anything is open to me. Mm -hmm. And then from that space of pause, I'm going to do the thing I wanted to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. The idea is to pattern interrupt basically. So whereas before, like if you, if you went straight into Tai Chi without that couple of seconds of waiting of mm -hmm. whatever, you were just like, ah, oh, I'm going to have a bad, bad phone call, you know, bad mood, whatever. And then just start doing Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. You will carry through all of that stuff before into your practice, into Tai Chi practice. Mm -hmm. But by coming to a point of like, say, call it stillness, pausing, unlocking, you can then choose a different path, a different way of being for the practice. Hmm. It's that kind of thing that we're pointing at here rather than like a coercive no, mm. almost. The mm. no is itself a stimulus that will cause a kind of holding, mm. I think. Like mm. It's almost, the pausing applies as much to any stop messages that you have as well. Right? Mm -hmm. If I'm telling myself to stop and to stand there and be tight, mm. pausing applies to that too. It's like, no, 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 I'm going to drop all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. and come back to a full dynamic aliveness presence mm -hmm. it's like a reset almost mm -hmm. like a, a dynamic reset i think it might be helpful for me at least to practice this with things that don't have a moral connotation or something mm, yeah of like yeah like the candy or like you know yeah. oh, I sh it should be like much like the feel when i think about this with the tai chi it's much more like oh yeah i'm gonna do the form like yeah, yeah that's yeah. what i'm here for but like i'm gonna introduce this pause to have mm. be conscious and present and do it skillfully rather than mm. you know absent-mindedly and that feels different than like because yeah, i yeah i think i could see that working into moral choices at some point but that feels mm. like high challenge level to start with or something yeah and in general when we teach this stuff it's like start with the easy stuff first mm -hmm. um so People always ask me, it's quite a common question in the course, like, it's really hard to have a founded awareness while doing coding. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, okay, so don't do that. <laughs> so I yeah. don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is why I say go for walks, like go mm -hmm. for a walk in nature without headphones or a podcast or like anything mm -hmm. plain in your ears, just like mm -hmm. go for a walk and practice there. Yeah, like, that's really easy. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily straightforward, but it's easier than like three hours worth of like focusing on a screen. Mm -hmm. um, and as you get better, you'll naturally get better. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the candy bar, mm -hmm. it's like your, you can notice your like compulsion or your resistance or whatever, actually, whatever the um, craving or resistance in the Buddhist frame might be like, oh, I'm craving, pause. Like it, it applies perfectly well to the, mm -hmm. what are they called? The three, um, so uh, craving, aversion and no self, illusion. Uh the that's the name for them but the three poisons or, three poisons that's yeah. it or the fires i think they're called in, in zen as well mm. um so you can apply i don't know if you can find it to no self but um at least well, to, to craving and aversion you can certainly pause at the moment of one of those things kicking in i mean delusion like ignorance. delusion that's yeah it. yeah no, exactly. no self is of the three characteristics which is a different ah, list, so. sorry yeah, yeah. The del isn't it delusion of the self or something like that or? yeah yes yeah, so, yeah. Okay. They're, they're, okay. they're related but not the same <laughs> fine <Yes. laughs> yeah. I, buddhists love that no ordered list don't they yeah, <laughs> so I, they sure I do them up sometimes yeah yeah <laughs> so I, I i think this is one area where there's intersection between at skills and mm -hmm. the dharma mm -hmm. and that oh I, I i see myself craving the candy bar mm -hmm. I'm not like, I'm going to, I'm going to pause. I'm going to inhibit that craving or mm -hmm. my response to that craving. And then at that point I can choose to indulge it or do something else. Mm -hmm. But I would argue almost that choosing to have the candy bar once you've interrupted the craving cycle is probably okay. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing it from a place of craving, mm -hmm. if your awareness is open and you're like fully choosing it because you want to rather than you've like gone through it and reasoned mm -hmm. as opposed to just going for it habitually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, it sounds like for some people, like coding is the hard mode. And like, uh, for me, like actually the candy bar, food, yeah. any kind of sensory <laughs> desire is going to be hard yeah. mode for me. And uh, yeah. like, I don't know, I mean, I do Tai Chi every day. It's like, seems like mm -hmm. the perfect venue to, I mean, you've said this totally. to me before, but it's like the perfect venue to practice this stuff. So yeah, um, it's especially because there, there's no moral connotation to it or like mm. better or worse for me it's like i mean i do want to like practice well but it's not the stakes are low you know 
Yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to practice in Tai Chi, then I think the beginning of this, the sequence is really mm -hmm. good place. And like, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to do it, right? It's no, like... The beginning and the end. Also, yeah. I mean, maybe it's a slightly different skill, but I'm really intrigued by this idea of like not stopping the practice. Mm. It's like, I'm still doing that as I go about my yeah. day. Okay, so there's, there's two games for you then. So the uh -huh. first one is when you start uh -huh. and you've gone through your preparations, mm -hmm. notice the, the desire to begin right mm. the impulse that oh i should begin now mm. and then just see what it's like to pause mm -hmm. and go like okay i see you impulse i see you habitual pattern we're going like not yet mm -hmm. beyond what you normally would do like just like a second or two even but like notice that like i should begin now right mm -hmm. um and go like not yet mm -hmm. not yet and then almost while body mind saying not yet begin the practice mm. right mm. and see what it's like to begin from mm. a not yet and is then, there yeah, a different the, phrase that I might use than not yet? Because I, I feel like if I use that phrase, it's just going to bring in that mood yeah. that I don't want to bring in. Pause, maybe. I think pause might if, work if better. If pause works for you, yeah. if pause works for you, then use that one. Yeah. Um, you could use maybe like soon or something. Soon, but yeah. Soon, soon. soon. Yeah. yeah so, but yeah. something just to go like, I see you and we will in a moment mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. and see what that move is like mm -hmm. and then from that move from within that move begin mm -hmm. right and just see what that's like and then mm -hmm. the thing at the end is like yeah when you finished what does don't, finishing mean don't keep finish going. Keep, keep keep going. doing tai chi as you walk off into your house yeah <laughs> right yes yeah and then if i get distracted and forget like if i'm like doing something i'd be like oh can i do tai chi while exactly I'm doing this? exactly so you will forget to do yeah. you'll, you'll which drop is fine the tai chi at some point exactly and then at yeah. some point you realize oh can i renew the tai chi renew the tai chi yeah while doing whatever it is you're doing uh -huh. i love this and um it's funny I'm, I'm reminded that like increasingly as i do more of these kinds of practices there's like inner translation work i have to do and yeah like like include instruction like for example when i learned tai chi I learned it on Zoom with Stan, who I had on the podcast. And like, basically there's no instructions about mindfulness or mm. meditation during it, other than like, you know, be aware of your body and your breath and that sort yeah. of thing. But like, I had to include this stuff for myself and yeah. I'm appreciating that in this conversation, uh, like the emotional quality feels really important to me. And I don't mm. have to like hide that I'm translating that added, oh, yeah, added sure. bit. It's just like, oh yeah, the not yet's not gonna, we're gonna have to mm. adapt, you know? And that's fine. I mean, yeah. this is this is one thing that I, I regret about my teaching style is that I can't do one on one lessons with everyone mm. because that kind of stuff comes up, mm -hmm. which is why I'm kind of like I, I caveat so much and like mm -hmm. have, try this, try this, doesn't work if you try this. But even a thing like not yet, mm -hmm. I think you're right. Some people be like they trip up on that. Or others mm -hmm. might get tripped up on pausing, they might see it differently or mm -hmm. soon is wrong or whatever. Uh -huh. Everyone's different. Um, but the the thing beneath all that that I'm pointing to. Is the, yeah. All these words are pointing at. There is a thing that it's like to kind of wait, uh -huh. <laughs> consciously uh -huh. wait, and then release from waiting. Yeah, it's the thing that I'm pointing at. Yes. My my yeah. teacher describes it almost like um, a, like a, a a feline, a cat, or like a leopard or something hunting something. Mm. It it seems if you look at it, it's not like they're deciding when to pounce. It's that they're already in pounce mode, and they just haven't pounced yet. Mm. So they're like they're like a coiled spring. And they kind of get not yet, not yet, not yet. Now I'll pounce. Mm -hmm. And it's not not yet in like you can't do it. It's bad for you to do it. It's like the time isn't right yet. Mm -hmm. Like we're waiting for the time to be right, and then we'll un like release the energy mm -hmm. that we've kind of stored, if you like, or that's mm -hmm. not ready yet for appropriate mm -hmm. time. So you could like almost you're aiming say like, and firing something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like the beginning of your tai chi sequence, it's not the word is wrong, but it's not inappropriate. It's like the time is not yet right. The time is not yet right. Ah, oh, now the spont like it's mm -hmm. that spontaneity thing of like you're inhibiting non-spontaneity until spontaneity makes it start of its own accord. So you're almost, yeah, you're allowing spontaneity. That's so interesting because like one of the primary ways that I practice this these days is in speech and in conversation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm realizing as you say that, that like a lot of times I am spontaneously saying something, but it's at like just not quite the right moment. It's like just a little late <laughs> yeah. or just a little early. And there is a right moment to say, it's like the right thing to say, but just off the right yes. time. Yes. Uh, so that uh, that's such an interesting aspect of it. I'll have to keep working yeah. on. And that's a classic example of inhibition, right? It's like, there's a conversation and you want to make a joke or make a point, 
but mm -hmm. at the time there's, there's no space yet mm -hmm. so you're kind of like not yet <laughs> like you're you're not saying i mustn't say this or you're like oh well it's too late it's like well let's leave that one parked mm -hmm. until there's a the right time there's a few things you might say and then oh the time is right say the thing mm -hmm. it's not suppression it's just not yet <laughs> mm -hmm. right it's it's inhibition in terms of saying the thing that you habitually want to say there are people who can't do this and in conversation they'll just blurt things out and it's like well that didn't work did it that, that just steamrolled over the whole conversation mm -hmm. but there's a skill in you know lovingly and consciously just choosing not to until the right moment mm -hmm. and if mm -hmm. the time comes if the time doesn't come because the conversation moves on then what a, oh no you know never mm -hmm. mind mm -hmm. next time mm -hmm. or maybe never that's fine too mm -hmm. We've covered so much territory in this conversation. Is there yeah. anything else that you'd want to say or talk about? I don't think so. I think I'm losing my voice anyway. So I'll okay. just say it's been a pleasure talking to you again. Um, yeah. I'm, it's always good to have a two and a half hour phone call. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, there are a few people I can do that with. So thank you for being one of them. Mm. Yeah, I'm so glad we could do this. It feels really nourishing for me personally. Mm. And I believe also of benefit to the world. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Mm.